unmuted. Adrian N. Breitfelder, City Clerk, you are hereby directed to call a regular session of the City Council to be held on Monday, December 19th, 2022 at 6.30 p.m. in the historic Federal Building for the purpose of conducting such business that may properly come before the City Council. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to a regular session of the Dubuque City Council for December 19th, 2022. As a reminder to our participants, you can provide in-person input or virtual audio and written input during the sections of the agenda where public input is accepted. Input options during the live meeting include, in-person attendees may approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any public input on the item they would like to speak to. Remote attendees can log into GoToMeeting using the login links, phone numbers, and access code that appear on the broadcast and live stream and posted on the front page of the meeting agenda. This option includes audio input and written chat input. If you are participating via computer, indicate which item you would like to speak to in the chat function or note that you would like to speak during the appropriate section. If you are participating via phone, indicate which item you would like to speak to when phone lines are unmuted. All phone lines will be unmuted during the consent agenda, public hearings, and public input periods, and city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. All comments, whether in person or virtual, must be accompanied by a name and address. Additionally, written public input is accepted by contacting the city council directly from the city's webpage at www.cityofdubuque.org slash council contacts and through the city clerk's office email at ctyclerk at cityofdubuque.org. This information will, reiterated, be, will be reiterated during the meeting. Attendance for the session is as follows. Mayor Kavanaugh. Here. Council members Farber. Here. Thank you. Jones. Here. Resnick. Hi. Roussel. Here. Sprank. Here. Wethel. Here. City manager Van Milligan. Here. Thank you. And city attorney Brumwell. Here. Thank you. Mayor Kavanaugh, I will turn it over to you for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Adrian. I invite all who are able to please rise and join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We will move on to consent items. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss one of the consent items, please approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input and state your name and address. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Please state the item you would like removed from the consent agenda for separate discussion and consideration. And consent items can be found on pages two through six of the agenda. Thank you, Adrian. Do we have anyone in chambers who would like to remove any of the consent items for separate discussion this evening? Seeing no one, do we have anyone virtually? No one virtually. Okay, bring it back to the table. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. I move to receive and file the documents, adopt the resolutions, and deal with the consent items as recommended. Second by Wethel. Got a motion by Resnick and a second by Wethel. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Jones. Aye. Farber. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Motion passes 7 0. We will move on to items set for public hearing, and we have two. First is resolution setting a public hearing on a proposed development agreement by and between the City of Dubuque, Iowa and McCoy Group Incorporated for the issuance of urban renewal tax increment revenue grant obligations pursuant to the development agreement for January 3rd, 2023. And second is resolution of necessity for the proposed urban renewal plan for the Twin Valley Urban Renewal Area for February 6th, 2023. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file, adopt the resolutions, and set the public hearings for the dates specified. Second by Sprank. Got a motion by Roussel and a second by Sprank. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Jones. Aye. Farber. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Motion passes 7 0. We will move on to public hearings. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss one of the public hearing items, please plan to approach the podium when the mayor asks if there is any in-person input for the public hearing you would like to speak to. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function and state your question 
or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input for the public hearing you would like to speak to. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Public hearing number one is rezoning Rosedale Avenue, St. Ambrose Street. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file the communications and further move that the requirement that a proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage to council meetings, part of the meeting of which is to be finally passed, be suspended. Second by Sprank. Got a motion by Jones and a second by Sprank. Wally, please. Yes, good evening, Mayor and City Council. Wally Wormont, Planning Services Manager. Um, the request before you tonight is a rezoning to rezone property from R1 single family residential to OR office residential. Um, this is the site of the St. Anthony School and their playground and ball field site um, as shown on the, the map here. Outlined in that black and white hatching is the area to be rezoned. It includes the uh, elementary school building located on the south side of the alley and then, like I mentioned before, the playground and the ball field located on the north, on the intersection of St. Ambrose and Clark Drive. Um, this is an, is an exhibit that's included in your packet. This shows the area kind of a little bit better. It's kind of shaded, kind of to help define that a little bit more. The portion of the parking lot will go along with the school building site to be rezoned. That lower um, portion, that's that large white box, that will be about over 100 parking spots still allocated for the St. Anthony's Church in order to meet their off-street parking requirement for the church service. Um, so the site is approximately 2.4 acres. Like I mentioned, it's a St. Anthony School site. Um, this came before the Zoning Advisory Commission as part of a public hearing. And uh, the applicants um, who are here tonight basically are proposing to convert that former St. Anthony School to 23 apartment buildings. Um, and as part of that conversion to 23, we look at the off-street parking requirements, one and a half parking space per unit. Um, the area that they're looking at rezoning and that shaded area um, doesn't include the required amount of off-street parking um, for that apartment building. Um, and then as we mentioned, that playground ball field site is, there's no plans for development at the site. There are requests to rezone to OR. That area could be used for anything that's permitted in an OR office residential district. Um, at the meeting, the applicants did note that they're hoping to develop it into additional residential units, which, whether or not it's an apartment or row houses or some other type of use. Um, this area is in compliance with the comprehensive plan. As you know, we are short uh, 1,200 residential units. We're trying to get those fulfilled um, by the end of this decade. Um, this area uh, it promotes the mixed use of housing and mixed use development. Um, although the area is primarily our one single family around here, it is a mixed use development. You have a large church campus, you have the senior high school facility, just down Clark Drive, you have the Red Cross, you have the Hillcrest Family Services. There is a big mixture of uses throughout the area and as you get up a little bit further to the intersection, there is some commercial development at Asbury University Avenue. Um, as we go through development, um, as we mentioned, the existing site's a little bit easier to handle with the school building. It's finite, it's there. Um, we know where it is, the footprint, uh, and looking at the number of units associated with that. But then there's the, the ball field playground site. And there are some concerns about what will actually be developed there. Um, anything that would go into that site that would have to meet the OR zoning requirements. Um, we would take that through our site plan review process, um, which would require a review by our development review team in which we look at multiple things for everything from access, parking, greening, screening, uh, paving, parkland, stormwater, you name it, that it goes through that unified development code uh, review um, for that, including fire safety access um, and parking. Um, so there was some questions at the Zoning Advisory Commission meeting. You see that it's not a unanimous decision. It was a three to two vote um, to approve the, the request. There were some concerns with regards to density of the site and then also traffic um, at that location. Uh, with, the, with the current site, the 23 unit apartment building, um, there will be no requirement for a traffic study to be conducted because the, the intensity of the use is quite diminished compared to what it was for a school site. Um, as they look at development on the future sites, the Zoning Advisory Commission, or excuse me, the DRT, the engineering department, would look at that development and determine whether or not a traffic study would be warranted at that location in order to address any concerns with traffic or flow. Um, we also look at the density and the parking that's associated with that development. Uh, if that is treated as a separate site, which is what they're looking at doing, it required detention area, required green space area, landscape buffer yards for parking, off street, and everything that's associated with that. 
I wanted to include this map because this, there was a petition that was submitted to the Zoning Advisory Commission outlined in red is our 200 foot notification requirement from the area to be rezoned. And in our ordinance, we have a requirement that if up to 20% of the land area is in opposition, that's owned by property owners that signed that petition, it forces a supermajority vote before the city council. So six of seven council members would have to approve in order to approve the rezoning request. Um, and when we calculate that, it actually comes out to about 36%. We did have some people sign those petitions that were located outside the 200 foot notification and we did have some individuals who were actually inside the 200 foot notification that were in favor. And we also had a tenant sign, they're not a property owner, but I'd like to know, um, to know what that on that site for that too. So that's all I have unless you guys have any questions for me. All right, thank you very much, Wally. We are on a public hearing to consider City Council approval of a request from Tom Kelzer, River Run Realty Dubuque, to rezone property located at Rosedale Avenue, St. Ambrose Street, from R1 single family residential to OR office residential. And the Zoning Advisory Commission is recommending approval. Do we have anyone present to address the council on this item? Please. And as you come up, um, I'll just say a couple of things here. So um, the, please remember to say your name and address. Um, the, the podium actually moves. There's a little button on the right side. You can up and down. So if we can't see your face behind the computer, you probably can't see us real well. Um, and then I've been mentioning too, as we, uh, as we go through items like this, you know, a lot of these types of issues are ones that are very personal to each of us. So as we do discuss this here, um, what I would ask is that you keep your comments focused on the matter at hand. So focus on the evidence, focus on the argument you wanna make. Don't focus on um, attacking or going against any, any but in particular or any, um, any person at this table or otherwise, or um, just anything personal in general. Keep it focused on the argument. So I appreciate you doing that. All right, yes please. Uh, good evening, my name is Tom Kelzer. I live at 9565 Royal Wood Drive. Uh, so myself and my partner Gary Carner uh, looking to purchase this property. Um, as we looked at it, we kind of felt that the highest and best use for this property would be for a uh, multifamily setup. And our focus would be on the actual school building initially. And so, uh, you know, as Wally had mentioned, I think the need was with the one and a half park installs per, I think we need like 34 spots. We do have room for 39 on site. So there wouldn't be, you know, an issue with, uh, with any of the parking being kept on the property. Um, the field itself, um, you know, we were looking at eventually doing apartments there. Um, figure probably, you know, 10 month build time or so for the building, get that done and then give us the time to develop the property. Um, obviously, you know, site plans, everything has to go through the city and the time it takes, you know, to get all those drawn and approved and make sure everything is done accordingly. Um, you know, that'd be kind of our, our time frame to start that project would be when we're finished with the the school building and we could work to get that one leased up and then start on the next next phase of the project. Um, I guess this, the other thing as far as traffic, uh, just with talking with St. Anthony's and this, when the school is there and how many students they had, uh, you know, drop off times, pick up times, you know, they had a couple hundred students, you had 34 teachers, you know, a little more concentrated to be in day, end of day, but through conferences and school events and things, you know, I think it would create a lot. Having Apartments there, I feel people leave at different times. I really, you know, I don't see that's gonna be really much of an impact on any of the parking, you know, around the area. And um, there has been, even through St. Anthony's, the parishioners, some that have interest in the apartments, even already wanting to get on the waiting list because, you know, they wanna stay part of St. Anthony's, the, the parish, and you know, move from maybe having a home and having all the issues with that and moving into an apartment. Um, so we've already, you know, had some interest in, in even having some of the units there as well. Um, I guess that's pretty much the project that we're looking to do and hope we can get your support. Thank you very much, Tom, for your comments. Any others tonight? You want to just just a quick note. If, if this is the item that you want to speak to, this is definitely the time because there's a public input later. But we're going to have already voted on this. Hi. Good evening. Uh, Richard Miller, 2080 Rosedale. 
And I come in opposition to the proposed rezoning going on up there. And I'm the gentleman that went around and, and did the petition and, and uh, talked to the neighbors up there. And it was pretty overwhelming to me that the opposition was overwhelming. Um, you know, in talking to some of the people, I'll, I'll point out a couple things that, that a lot of them said. They said that, uh, you know, if this does go through, I'm going to move. And uh, I find that kind of disheartening. I was a neighbor and, and as a resident up there, too. So, you know, my main concerns are that the density. This is right in the middle of all the neighborhoods in question up there. And to bring in that density of people brings issues. Um, you know, I, I've seen other places, and uh, there are a lot of things that go wrong. I mean, everything from uh, garbage to traffic to noise to parking. We don't know who's moving in there. Uh, we don't know how long they're staying. Um, so it, it makes it just very uncomfortable for the neighbors. And like I said, it was just overwhelming what the neighbors thought. Um, you know, and I think about what's going on up there, uh, a word that comes to mind is pride. The pride that, that all us neighbors take in our neighborhood. And, um, you know, I, I, I think about Jill up on the corner and the garden she has and the apple trees. I think about Austin, who has roses covering his front yards to, to welcome everybody to Rosedale. Uh, I think about Norma Lang and going up to her place and, and her having a cold drink and that. And I just don't see that pride in a multi-unit apartment building. So I think it really is a detriment to our neighborhood and, and uh, I oppose what's going on. So thank you. Thank you very much, Richard, for your comments. Hey, good evening. My name is Austin Clark. I got the roses, as uh, Rich mentioned. Um, I hear it, I'm here in opposition as well. Um, while not in favor of the rezoning project as a whole, I think it's in crucial uh, for the council to consider this as two separate requests. There's two very different areas. Uh, project one, I'm referring to as project. Project one being the rezoning and uh, remodel of the existing school building, which I talked about. And project two, the rezoning of the green space. Um, and according to the uh, or residential zoning guidelines, there's up to 45 potential options. <clears throat> Some of the other potential uses, um, I know it's, it's, they're slating it for uh, more apartments, but it could be, if changed into this category, uh, medical office, uh, mortuary, a funeral home, a parking structure, a private club, a uh, crematorium. And again, while the developers said their intentions are to build an apartment complex, there is no guarantee in this. Uh, according to a public meeting hosted by GT Development on December 6th, they invited us out. Their intention is to renovate the current building structure into approximately 23 two-bedroom apartments, or what I'm referring to as Project 1. Project 1, rezoning of the existing building that was formerly the school, I am in opposition to this portion uh, because historically apartment complexes will lower property values of the surrounding existing homes. Parking is already an issue and it will get worse if the population density increases. I understand the developers have to comply with code and parking regulations, uh, but more residents will magnify existing challenges uh, the area already faces. After Project 1, developers said their intent would be to start to what I'm going to refer to as Project 2. Project 2 would be to use the green space to build additional apartment complexes. The developers estimated, I think, an additional 24 two-bedroom units. And according to conversation with the city uh, zoning employee, the developers could potentially build on that level up to 40 foot high is kind of the threshold. And they would be required uh, currently that only 20% of the area and the footprint remain a green space by new code, as to my understanding. A 40-foot high building would literally affect what time the sun rises and sets, especially in the winter months. We're almost at solstice here, for at least seven homes on the north side of Clark Drive. A 40-foot tall building would rob them of sunlight entering their homes on the southern facing side. It would reduce their property value inevitably and change their existing view 
um, of instead looking out their front windows and seeing a park, which it is now, they would see a 40 foot tall building. The, con the current development area that they're looking at uh, for project two is approximately 1.3 acres. Therefore, uh, using the 20% green space, just over an acre could be land that's turned into an impermeable structure, forcing runoff into the city drains. <clears throat> Development of this green space would be in complete contradiction to what the city has been trying to accomplish via the B Branch project. Uh, if you'll note the area, most of the alleyways around ours, uh, our neighborhood, were in the green alleyway reconstruction project and have been a part of that. According to the city's website, uh, the city spent, I think it's coming up on $249 million on the B Branch project, and they could acquire this area, which would help prevent that runoff, what I estimate about $400,000. Um, and that was based on conversations uh, with church representatives. So after minimal research, it appears uh, there are numerous state and federal grants uh, that could help the city pay for this. Obviously, a new park is gonna cost money. Um, it would help pay for the acquisition, uh, as well as expenses and improvements. Some examples of these grants are the Iowa REAP Funds, Outdoor Re Recreational Legacy Partnership Program, and the National Recreation Park Association, where easy uh, to find grants and funds that are available to cities that would apply to this instance. I would like to point out that it would appear that the city would be stepping outside of what is considered normal guidelines to approve this rezoning request um, because the green space has been included, hence the designation of two different projects. <clears throat> According to the city website, uh, the quote is, or district is not intended to have any application in undeveloped or newly developing areas of the city. I think it would be fair to say the proposed green space is without a doubt undeveloped. It's a park, it's been a park for a while. As most guidelines, they are just that, guidelines. In a conversation with a city zoning employee, uh, they stated it is acceptable for the city to go outside of the guidelines on a case-by-case -case basis. In this case, stepping out of the normal guidelines for GT development would mean that you are giving them potential opportunity to build a parking structure <clears throat> or a crematorium in our neighborhood. By approving GT development's request tonight, the council would be stepping outside of normal guidelines that protect Dubuque residents' best interests for a developer. <clears throat> they would be stepping outside these guidelines for a developer who has a recent history of disciplinary action from the Iowa Real Estate Commission uh, in July of 2021. This disciplinary action was a result of an owner of GT development being, and I quote, charged with engaging in practice harmful or detrimental to the public and or failing to diligently exercise reasonable skill and care in providing brokerage services, end quote. I feel it is a reasonable request to ask the council not to step outside of normal guidelines for individuals with a known history of breaking Iowa real estate laws. To recap, my opposition, by agreeing to rezone the proposed property this evening, you would have to believe that a few apartments are more important than the neighborhood which is in clearly opposition to the project. Voting to rezone means that you accept that many homes would be impacted negatively. You would have to believe more apartments are better for the city than the opportunity to maybe capitalize on a rare opportunity to be able to create a park. You would be rezoning an area that would negatively affect the B Branch project. Lastly, and most concerning, you would be awarding this rezoning to developers with a history that clearly shows negligent business practices in real estate. So at a minimum this evening, I ask that you deny the green space from being uh, rezoned. Thank you. Thank you, Austin, for your comments. Any others? My name is Stan Sampson, 2501 Jackson Street. Stan, if you want, there's uh, on the right there, there's a little on the bottom. You can put that down so we can see you just a little better. That way you can still talk into the oh, mic. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Okay. Uh, 2501 Jackson Street, and I'm here to support the, the, um, the project, the uh, housing development project. Uh, I, I think it's a uh, good thing for my... Uh, the core of my community and his good apartments and affordable apartments is really hard to find here in town now. So I'm here to support the project. 
Thank you, Stan, for your comments. <clears throat> Any others? Okay, seeing nobody else here then, do we have any virtual comments this evening? There are no virtual comments, but written input was submitted by Marion Morris of 1440 South Grandview Avenue, as well as written input submitted by Austin Clark. Okay, thank you very much. All right, then I'm gonna bring it back to the table for discussion here. I'm actually gonna kick us off with a couple of questions first before, we, um, before I open it up to my council colleagues. Wally, the questions are directly for you. Um, so first question, could you talk a little bit more about the development review team? I think we could use some clarification on what it means um, when we zone something now, and then there, and then plans come to, come to the city to be able to actually build something. They go through another phase of uh, review. So if you could lay that out for us a little bit more, we'd appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, sure. So regardless if it's rezoned or not, I mean, if any development that comes in the city um, requ that requires a site plan, and site plans are only required for um, Residential units are three or more. Single family homes and duplexes don't actually require site plans. They actually set up a pre-application meeting where they actually meet with myself and the planning department with Sheena Moon, our associate planner. She helps uh, manages our DRT and then also our engineering department. That pre-application meeting is kind of like an informational meeting about what they need to submit for the review. We provide them a pack of information, outlines a lot of the items that need to be submitted. Um, and then we work with uh, their engineer or their architect or whoever is working on developing the site plan. Um, from there, we'll get a site plan that gets submitted to our office, and then we distribute that to our development review team. So there's core team members, which is going to be your, your planning, your building, your fire department, your water and engineering department. But that plan actually goes out to the parks department, the health department. I mean, all the departments in the city actually get copied on that request. Um, so any of those departments are free to attend those meetings. Uh, we get that site plan that gets routed around through those various departments. They look at all their basic code requirements. So for us, with the Unified Development Code, um, our department, we're looking at landscaping, how big the building is, how close to the property lines, land use. Um, in addition to open space, we get involved with landscape buffer yards from parking lots, number of parking spaces. So that all gets handled. There's quite a few other things that get handled by the planning department. Engineering department's looking at traffic, safety, um, stormwater review, so because this is over an acre, there would be required for detention on the site, so there would be a detention facility that would be required if they came in with the development um, for that. Um, they're, in addition, they're looking at how sanitary sewer connects to the site, um, and then also access to the street, where's the curb cuts, where's the alleys. Um, the other department, water department, is obviously looking at location of fire hydrant locations, domestic water being able to provide the site. Is there required for a sprinkler system? Do they have a required amount of uh, uh, capacity to be able to handle that. Also what they call a post indicating valve that they work with the fire department hand in hand on those requests. Um, and then also the building department's obviously looking at building codes for safety, for fire rating uh, of the, the property. They also look at ADA accessibility in and out of the building in addition to the parking lots. And then also um, to touch back with the fire department, they're looking at uh, fire action protection. Can they get around the building if there's a situation, especially if we get involved with taller buildings, greater than two stories, um, they have the ability to get the apparatus to be able to fight for that, uh, fires for that. So that actually goes through an entire process. That's all it gets reviewed and they get submitted back to the engineer to make sure that they get it revised to meet all those requirements. We get a revised plan, comes back to the office, gets rerouted um, to make sure they're in compliance with all the required codes um, before that. And that's just the site plan review. There's a whole section Another review that's primarily with the building department, the fire department, they're reviewing the actual building plans and the interior of the space um, for that, that type of space. So um, once that site plan goes through our office, it gets reviewed, it gets stamped, it gets approved, um, then they can apply for a building permit um, during construction. There's inspections made by those various departments. Um, and then prior to final approval or an occupancy permit, all those departments go out and inspect, make sure all the code elements have been followed. Um, there are certain situations where landscaping may not be placed right away due to, like this time of year, um, we'll give them a moratorium to make some of those improvements um, for that. So that's the gist of that, that process when we get involved with the site plan review for that. So Okay. And then my other question uh, before I open it up here is, uh, there, there's a... There was a comment that we may be outside of the normal guidelines of what we're doing for zoning tonight and the request that's before us. Um, can you speak to that? I mean, is this outside of the normal guidelines that we would have as a council as far so as So we actually zone? go through a public hearing process to be able to open up that. So uh, there is a lot of discussion about the intent, right? What's the intent of the OR district? 
Um, this is a developed area. Uh, it is a park. It is a park, uh, park land and development. Um, I know there are some discussions about maybe using it as a park and a couple things I like to describe. I like how do we, how do we get a park in the city first off? Because that was a question that was brought up before previously. Um, typically our park land development is either part of a major subdivision plat which we have guidelines or requirements for the amount of park space that's allowed for that. Um, but a lot of the times uh, land would be maybe purchased and donated or dedicated to the city and it's up to this council whether or not, whether or not they want to accept that land for park land. In addition to that, uh, the Leisure Services Department is going to be going through a Dubuque uh, master plan for all the parks development coming up here shortly. I know um, Marie is very happy to have her fellow project manager hired to help assist with that. So, um, and then also we also look at uh, distance from recreation because when we talk about density, we want to talk about how close are to the park area, you know, for playground space, for recreation, for grilling out. Um, and then with those discussions I've had with Leisure Service Department, obviously we have uh, Flora Park in proximity in addition to Allison Henderson Park. We have the dog park location down the south for Bunker Hill and then also we have some open space that's somewhat public at the uh, um, Dubuque Senior High School, some other locations for that. So um, when we go through this process, there is a public hearing. Uh, everyone gets an opportunity to speak and address their concerns. And uh, so basically what we're here is to look at the code reviews, make sure they're meeting the requirements, um, make sure that they're following um, our comprehensive plan and make sure um, that what we're approving here is appropriate for the location. Nothing set in stone, I guess you should say. Um, there's also ongoing changes in our community. We have areas where it may be single family home, it may be rezoned to R2, may be rezoned to a commercial development. The history of the site actually was initially multifamily residential in 1975. It was rezoned to R1 single family in 1985 and it's remained as R1 single family since then. Um, and in the area, has it changed? Yes, I would say things have changed in the area, especially with, for instance, the school closing, which, you know, a lot of times when we talk about schools, the best thing for a school is an adaptive of use and not a, a vacant building sitting there. So, for instance, we have the Sacred Heart Church being adaptive of use, Franklin School, Holy Ghost. So a lot of times those are adaptive of use of those buildings. St. Patrick's School is another good example. Almost all of those have been a re developed into residential type uses because typically the buildings have large open ways, walkways, and, and a lot of times they take advantage of historic tax credits too for the adaptive use of those buildings. So I don't know if I answered your question. I know I threw a lot at you, no, Mr. Mayor. I, I, okay. I think you did, at least we'll see if everybody else feels that way, but yeah, I appreciate that. So yes, Mr. Resnick. Um, Mr. Van Milligan would like your attention. Oh, Mr. Van Milligan, sorry, I didn't hear you. Mike, are you there? Uh, that, that, wasn't, that was not me. Oh. <laughs> Must have been me. Okay. <laughs> no, the president's I, I, getting you confused with himself. No, I'm just kidding. I thought I was being helpful, but thank you. I will ask a couple yep. of questions. My, my concern is why is the, the, our commission so divided on this? Could uh, maybe the chair or you enlighten yeah. us about uh, what, was the, uh, what was the problem there? Sure, yeah. Most of the discussion entailed with regards to density and traffic in the neighborhood. Um, there was also concern about loss of green space. So when you look at the site, it's historically been a playground, open space in the neighborhood. Um, so when there was discussion going on, two of the individuals um, felt that the additional amount of uh, units in the area and then the loss of green space, and then also concerns with traffic through the area were their major concerns, um, and that's why they voted no to the opposition to the rezoning. The other three individuals uh, basically reviewed the request and. Um, there was a lot of discussion about our DRT review process, um, about what would be reviewed and um, for the development, how we go about doing that. Because a lot of times it's the unknown. It's a vacant piece of property and we don't have a plan in front of us, right? We have a plan for the school, 23 units. We have another site here that could be anything in an OR district. So it could be, but it could be a medical office building, it could be uh, a funeral, anything that's listed in that permitted use list would be uh, allowed at that location, provided they meet all the code requirements for setbacks, size, and everything that's associated with that. So, I see. so um, I guess my, my question is, no matter what's up there, we do have, uh, they have to have a certain amount of green space. There are setbacks mm -hmm. and there are so much, I mean, th those are already part of the process. I don't understand, you know, the, the feeling part. Well, I just feel that this is a lot. Is, don't we, can't we do better with data than uh, whether we just feel? Uh, my, 
what I've sat through for years is that that all the things that you a you a answered the mayor's question and all those talked about that we have to do things right. That, that includes green space and, and uh, water runoff and all the different things that happen. So I, I guess I uh, don't understand why the commission, this seems pretty straightforward because it's only the first step of a process uh, and that every bit will have to be approved by the council eventually. And um, I mean, if, we have plans. If we have plans for a, a crematorium, that's probably not going to be approved by the council. I'm just guessing. But uh, those type of things that are also allowed in, in OC. Um, so um, anyway, so the adaptive, uh, according to uh, some of the folks around, I'm picking up that perhaps the adaptive reuse of the school building is okay, but the open field is not okay. Now, the open field is a private open field, right? It's owned by the church. And for years, yes, the neighbors have been able to enjoy it. I'm glad that they have been. But it is a pri it is private property. And what goes up there will have to be approved by the city and has to have green space and, and all the other amenities that uh, and requirements um, you, you, that you mentioned. One question I have is, you have two different maps up here. One has the alley being closed and one has the alley being opened. Is that still an open question? So when I asked uh, dev uh, potential developers, there's a purchase office on, offer on this. I don't know if it's been purchased or not. They might be able to explain that. But the intention is, is to leave that alley open um, for the space. So um, I, j I just need to explain a little bit something here, too. Because when you're looking at rezoning a piece of property and you rezone it to a certain zoning district, you, everything that's permitted in that entire zone would just be allowed at that location. So. Um, after the rezoning approval here, nothing would come back before the city council um, for the review. It would just go through our city development review board, or development review team for that. So a crematorium could come and build that, let the location and the city council would have uh, no review over that. That would just go through the development review team um, for that. So that's kind of controlled through the entire zone, the zoning district that's for the site. Um, this location, and I just want to kind of throw some numbers out to you, just kind of let you a little bit know, because density is a big issue. So um, the required setbacks for, for the property or for a building located at this, at this site, um, you know, it's, it's a corner lot, so we're going to have a greater setback from the property lines along Clark Drive and St. Ambrose. There's a minimum of 20% of the entire site needs to remain in green space. So that's probably going to exceed that because of the site, there's gonna be required to have a detention location on the, on the site. And detention could be multiple things. It could actually be an open drainage area. So just to kind of give you some examples of existing buildings, the um, um, Gardens of Dubuque is actually located on almost a 90,000 square foot site. This site is about 40 or 64,000 square feet. Um, they have detention on that site. They have off-street parking on that site. Roosevelt West is 44 units. Um, they're about a 90,000 square foot site. Um, same thing, they have detention located on that site. Um, and then the maximum building height there is 40 feet for that. So it's a little bit different for those sites because they're not on a corner. They don't have as great a setbacks. They just have the front yard setback that they have to deal with. So um, we're going to review those if it gets approved and, and if an apartment complex comes in because I can't say it, it's going to be an apartment complex until we actually have something submitted to our office for our review for that. Uh, thank you for the information, uh, and I liked all the answers except that last little bit that you mentioned there. <laughs> and uh, you're saying that uh, we could have uh, uh, something there and we wouldn't have any say about it. You said it goes through a process that's all mm -hmm. staff. Um, it's all about the, what the staff uh, works with, or we've approved that tonight, you said. When you approve tonight, you approve the standards and the guidelines of which we have to follow as staff to and for regulations. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, the council has approved things and uh, with conditions, haven't Correct. we? So that's still a possibility too. Yes, tonight. so one thing you could do is, it's called a conditional rezoning. If you choose to strike certain uses from the list of permitted uses, that would require you to um, table the request. We would have to go back to the applicant and explain to them if they're in favor of that condition, of the conditions, they'd have to sign a memorandum of agreement, and then we can bring it back to, to the city council for your approval. We've done that in the past for some other properties where there are some concerns about certain types of permitted uses on the site. Okay, thank you for that information. Mm -hmm. I, I like that, mm -hmm. that bit. All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. 
Well, um, churches are shrinking nationwide. Membership is shrinking. Financial support is shrinking. Properties are being walked away from. And we've been really lucky in Dubuque to have people come forward and make reasonable offers to rehabilitate, and restore, and return those properties to, to good use. Um, and I have to emphasize luck because it can go the other way where they can fairly quickly and ugly become vacant and abandoned, and abandoned structures um, with, uh, with some insulation from government sometimes to, to make it difficult to acquire them or to do enforcement and things because of their religious connections. Um, I, I really like this project. 23 apartments doesn't alarm me at all. It's way less dense than having a school there and the traffic that ebbs and flows with that. It's a busy, beautiful neighborhood, um, but there's some major things happening in that neighborhood too with senior high school right there, with Clark University right there, with all the businesses on Asbury and Hillcrest, with the Hill, Hillcrest services right there, um, with fuel stations and and everything else. It, it's a, there are major arterials, it's major traffic, all the time. 23 apartments doesn't do much for traffic. 23 apartments is a drop in the bucket. Setback quite a ways away from these folks. It's not like it'll be abutting their buildings. Um, that doesn't alarm me at all. Big open field. That, that really has, in, in my view, the, the rights of the owner of that field um, are paramount here. And we restrict things that owners can do to things all the time, but the fact is they own it. Um, we have to lean into what their wishes are and try to make them happen as long as they don't impose unreasonable outcomes on the rest of the city and the rest of the neighbors, neighborhood. And an apartment building doesn't do that. It's a place where people live, just like the homes that were all red and colored on the map that you gave us. It's a place where people live. And historically, I'm not aware of property values going down because rental units occurred in an area. Um, I don't think it happens. In fact, we see historically in this city that property values continue to incrementally increase year to year to year to year to year, almost no matter what. Um, but this adds value to the neighborhood far and beyond an empty abandoned building, which is one of the possible outcomes that could be there. Um, now, that's, that's one piece of the discussion. The other piece is we're starving for places for people to live in this community. It's impacting our ability to, to create jobs. It's impacting employers' ability to fill jobs. It's impacting all of our economic opportunity um, by not having a place for people to, to come and choose to live here. What we're seeing globally is that young people entering the workforce aren't choosing a job and then, a, then moving to the community where the job is. They're choosing a community, then finding the job when they get there. And we want to be that community of choice. And you can't be if there's no place for anybody to live. And right now, that's a big part of it. Um, I don't think it impacts anybody's roses. I don't think it impacts anything at all in the neighborhood except giving us some more people to learn to, to understand and know and be neighborly with and opportunities to, to grow your circle of friends. Um, so I'm, I'm going to support this. Um, I understand what the Zoning Advisory Commission was up against and uh, talked to one of the commissioners that I happened to work with who, who was a negative vote, and I, I see where she was coming from. Um, but I think the right thing to do is to make this zoning change. I think we've got a developer who's done some other good work in the city, and I think we've got a good project here that we have to get behind. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Ms. Roussel. Thank you. Uh, Wally, I'm not sure if you can answer this or maybe Mr. Kelzer or if anyone knows, one of the people I talked to on the phone said that the church had a covenant with the property, uh, the people who were going to purchase the property that would somewhat limit, the, would um, more limit the uses of the land that is adjacent to their church. Are you aware of any such document? I'd have to defer to the, to the developer who's purchasing the property. Mr. Kells, you can come up and answer that question if you're able. And yes, working through the process with uh, the archdiocese, and um, there will be additional covenants uh, placed on the property by them. Um, you know, a lot of things having to do with um, 
you know, anything that was against church doctrine. So, you know, couldn't be any medical facilities that would perform abortions or um, even, um, you know, places of establishments that would have alcohol and, you know, there's, there's quite a few things that would be in there as well. Um, you know, I think as everybody's talking, the demand is for apartments and I don't know that I've had a whole lot of demand for, you know, I'm a broker as well, I've heard of much as far as crematoriums. I mean, but if that's something that, you know, we'd want to add to the covenants, you know, we certainly would be willing to do that as well. So there is quite a few restrictions on the property already. That's more so than what OR would even be. Okay, thank you. I think those are some of the kinds of things that might alleviate some concerns of, of some of the neighbors. Um, and, and I do think OR is meant to be in a residential um, in a residential area to kind of buffer between um, the R1 and the multifamily. And, and I think one of the things that when I grew up in the area, so I know the neighborhood well, um, and I think an empty, abandoned school building is the worst possible thing that could happen for your neighborhood. Um, I've seen them in some of the other communities that I've worked in, and it's, it's a very sad, a very sad sight. So the people that own this property, something's going to go in there, and I do believe that um, housing is the highest and best use of that property. Um, so I, I thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rousseau. Ms. Wethel. I can imagine that um, the loss of the school was a difficult thing to swallow for your neighborhood. Um, I had two children go through that entire elementary school at Our Lady of Guadalupe, and so I'm really familiar with your roses, sir, and I'm familiar with how beautiful your neighborhood is and how welcoming it is to all of those children and all of those families for so many years. Um, so I can appreciate that this is a big change to consider for you. Um, before I had those children, I was newly out of nursing school, and the only thing my husband and I could afford newly married was a two bedroom, two bathroom apartment. And so when we talk about the need for teachers and nurses and police and fire, and we want families to start their lives here, this is a place that they could do that. And so although I too am very sad to see that the school closed I have to tell you that I'm really sad when we have to close beds at our hospital when we don't have nurses. And so I have to look at the broader picture as well. And it is not that your concerns are falling on me in a deaf way, um, but I have to tell you the need is a crisis. And so I am going to support this. I do not want to create additional restrictions um, of conditional rezoning in my eyes. Um, the more that we hold up development such as this that would be affordable for people in our community, we do them a disservice. And I feel strongly that um, we should move forward with this tonight. Thank you. Mr. Sprank. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, I'm all for this. This makes sense. We need housing. Um, if any of you folks remember the Catholic school, the Holy Ghost, uh, Holy Trinity school down there in Romberg, when they tore that down, a developer built a ton of these little side-by-side -side condos, and they're all rented to seniors who, lit, who grew up in the neighborhood, who wanted to stay in the neighborhood, and love that they live right by neighbors. Some of them never even met some of their other neighbors because they went to different mass times and they've formed a community. And I have a very good feeling that that's what will happen here. You'll have neighbors that want to stay in the neighborhood, that don't want to get out of there, that can't lit, they're probably seniors that may not even want to stay in their houses anymore, that just want to stay in the neighborhood, but they can afford a small two bedroom apartment, maybe not small, but a two bedroom apartment in general. So I'm, I'm all for this. This just makes sense. We know we need housing, so thank you. Thank you. Ms. Farber, I want to give you an opportunity to jump in. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, and um, I greatly appreciate what all of my colleagues have said tonight there at the, um, the table. Uh, very uh, appropriately, uh, I support all that they have said uh, in that respect. And I am very much uh, in support of the adaptive reuse um, of the school. 
And I think change for neighborhoods is not negative necessarily. I think it's a good thing. Um, and what I like about this location and this opportunity is that we can hire or have the potential opportunity to hire more teachers, more administrators for the college or for senior high, or have some of the workforce that can walk to the neighborhood uh, businesses, whether it's Hillcrest, Asbury Square, um, the Red Cross, et cetera. So I think it's um, a good move. I agree that we need more housing uh, to incent our workforce to stay. And uh, I think that this will be um, a welcome to the neighborhood as well. Uh, and I do want to give a shout out to all of the neighbors there that took the time and energy to petition and to share with us their thoughts and their communications. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, very quickly. Yeah, Mr. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I appreciate all, all the neighborhoods, uh, the neighbors that came. I'm in this neighborhood all the time. My kids also went to St. Anthony. And uh, it's a, it is a wonderful neighborhood, uh, families have been there for a long time, really care about their uh, neighborhoods. And that's something I, I noticed uh, when we came to Dubuque some 30 years ago, that uh, there's different from where we came from, is every neighborhood seemed to have some very dedicated people who live there, are proud of their neighborhood, keep it up. And it was fantastic. My, my wife and I really enjoyed that about Dubuque. Um, now, I mentioned that I would prefer conditional aspects to be uh, put in here in writing, but I can see that we don't have that, um, we don't have that kind of flavor here uh, tonight at the council uh, to get, we want to get going on this. I must admit that I am, um, because of the process answers by Mr. Wernemann and the covenants required by the developer required by the archdiocese, I'm persuaded that we need to go ahead tonight and I'll, I will support this. But we need to keep our eye on this development. And uh, we've got, um, you know, there's, there's a lot that can happen, a lot of great things that can happen. Let's make sure that they do. And uh, so uh, I appreciate, again, all the input that we've had. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Well, I appreciate this discussion. Um, thank you very much for everyone who was able to, to stand up and speak about this tonight. I think it's really important that we have these discussions. Well, oh, did you have anything? I just, I just want to reiterate yeah. because of the opposition before you tonight, in order for this to pass, it's a super majority vote. So six of the seven council members need to vote in favor. I just want to uh, just bring that to your attention. Excellent, thank you, Wally, appreciate that. Um, and it, I think that brings a good point too. You know, this discussion didn't start here this evening. It started at, you know, with our commission doing their work at the Zoning Advisory Commission. Um, started with a discussion between the neighbors and the developer. I think these are important ways that we take care of this. Uh, you know, one of the things that, that I notice frequently when we talk about rezoning is that um, we go through a very careful review process in this city. Uh, if you'll notice, you know, and, and I'm not, not going to knock any other cities by name, but you drive through some places sometimes where you recognize that zoning wasn't all that important at certain points in history. And you get there and you realize, why would you put that right there next to that? And it's because it wasn't reviewed carefully. It's because we didn't, the processes weren't in place. Uh, one of the things about Dubuque that has, has gone really well is that we've been able to do that. Now, one of the things that's changing, and this is rather sudden, I, I think we need to admit this, is that we are seeing a lot of development all of a sudden. We haven't seen this before. This isn't something that we're, we're used to dealing with. Um, there are a lot of different factors involved. It, part of it is that we keep saying we need housing. I mean, we're talking about it, and then people are answering the call. We've got developers showing up to say, okay, we can build some stuff. We can change these old buildings into something different and make sure that we have housing. So that's one part of it. Another part of it is something Mr. Jones brought up. Um, you know, we are seeing schools close and change. This is a you know, um, having gone through the, the school district here, having um, fr many friends who are in the Holy Catholic family system, you know, it's, or, I'm sorry, Holy Family Catholic system, it, it, uh, it, I didn't see schools closing that often when I was growing up. And all of a sudden now, it seems like it's happening quite a bit. It's a part of our demographic shift. It's just something that's happening and we're gonna have to continue to deal with it. I have to agree with my council colleagues that the, the highest and best use and oftentimes of these empty buildings is living space for people. We've seen um, not, not just the developer before us tonight, but other developers that have turned some of these spaces into, into living quarters for people and it's actually very, very helpful. So, um, you know, with that confluence of events, it, it brings, uh, I think, a speed of change that can be 
kind of disconcerting. And I think that's a lot of what we're going through. I get what you're talking about as, as a neighborhood. Your neighborhood has looked this way for a long time. It's been a certain way for a long time. It's difficult to think about how that might change. I would caution us um, to, to try and avoid thinking about the worst case scenario in each and every instance. Um, you know, as part of the joy of doing what we do up here is we get to see a lot of the city. We get to talk to a lot of people in a lot of different places. And having been all over Dubuque, one of the things I recognize is that um, great neighborhoods come in lots of different shapes and sizes. I mean, they, great neighbors actually come in lots of different shapes and sizes. Where I currently live now, I live by more um, people in apartments than I've ever lived in my entire life. And um, it, to be completely honest with you, it, I wasn't sure what to expect when I first moved in to, to where I live. But um, having lived there now, you know, one of the things that I see is the, the pride that people take in neighborhoods comes in many shapes and sizes too. And I think that we, uh, I think that this is an opportunity for um, another neighborhood to form in a different way. I trust our process. I trust our development process and the staff that we have in the city to make sure that things are going to to be developed in a way that is good for a neighborhood and not detrimental. So um, with that, and um, all the things that I have heard tonight, I'm, I definitely plan to support this as well. So um, I, I look forward to the process continuing, um, look forward to the developer continuing to be a good neighbor and, and, be, and, and uh, work with the neighborhood to be able to, to move this forward. Um, but as far as this goes, um, rezoning this particular property, uh, my vote will be a yes on this particular item. So any other discussion before we call the vote? Okay, then we have a motion by Jones and a second by Sprank to waive the three readings and uh, receive and file. So Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move final consideration and passage of the ordinance. Second by Sprank. Got a motion by Jones and a second by Sprank. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Public hearing number two is amending the Dubuque Industrial Center planned unit development. Mr. Mayor. And Mr. Jones. We move to receive and file the communications and further move that the requirement that a proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings, prior to the meeting of which is to be finally passed, be suspended. Second. And a motion by Jones and a second by Resnick. Wally, please. You bet, Wally, one of my planning services manager, City of Dubuque, just waiting for this PowerPoint to pull up here. You guys can see that, there you go. Yes, um, the request before you tonight is to uh, amend the Dubuque Industrial Center plan unit development. Um, the map before you is kind of showing the area in question, the black and white checkered boundary area, is a request to amend the PUD. And, and this is the fact that the, the plan unit development has identified this area as open space. Um, when the Dubuque Industrial Center development was developed initially, um, there's a lot more open space. Some of the other, other areas that are shown on there, you see the tree cover off to the right-hand side. Actually, the area to the north, which is red now, which was a recent rezoning, I shouldn't say recent, it's been over a year now, for um, to C1 uh, or C3 general commercial property. Those were all open spaces. And what's happened here is there's been a request to purchase this property um, and then grade it to, in order to allow some expansion of, of the existing uh, Geisler Brothers building. They're actually locate, uh, looking at building a smaller building on the site in order to help with some of their um, expansion needs for, for the location. Uh, when we look at these areas, there's a, a stormwater review that flows through the site. Um, that will be handled through our development review team um, for the site. But just to kind of give you a little characteristic, it's five and a half acre site. Um, and it's owned by the Geisler Brothers. Um, like I mentioned, we're looking at reclassifying just the land use area. So in that Dubuque Industrial Center plan, it actually it says open space. So we're just changing that from open space um, to allow it as an industrial use on the site. And then in relationship to that, we have setbacks from different property lines um, for the area, and those are being amended as well. All other development requirements in that PUD remain unchanged. That includes all the land uses, accessory uses, lot setbacks, 
how big a building, signage, site lining, stormwater, several other things that will go through there. And like I mentioned before, um, the stormwater review is something with this site that will definitely be reviewed. It is a ravine that's being proposed to be recreated um, in order to allow some expansion into that site. Um, just, just an attachment included as part of the ordinance. This is just showing the area um, that is being changed to Dubuque Industrial Center land use for the site. Um, the other area is kind of shaded in green on there is actually showing the open space um, in the park. There's still quite a bit of open space in that area. And then also this is just helping dictate what the setback requirements would be along that property line. Um, if they do build in a building on there, it could straddle, straddle that property line, then that actually encumbers both of those parcels as, as one property for that at that location. The Zoning Advisory Commission held the public hearing. Um, there was no unspoken opposition to the request. We did have one email that was sent in support from a property owner that was notified in the, in the uh, industrial park. So by a vote of five to zero, the Zoning Advisory Commission recommends the City Council approve the request. That's all I have. Thank you, Wally. We are in a public hearing. I'm sorry. To consider a request from Todd Geisler and Geisler Brothers Realty LLC to amend the Dubuque Industrial Center Planned Unit Development and the Zoning Advisory Commission is recommending approval. Do we have anyone present in chambers to discuss this with council? Good evening, Mr. Mayor, ladies and gentlemen of the council. Uh, my name is Rick Dickinson. Uh, I am the president of Greater Dubuque Development Corporation. I rise in support of this application uh, and thank you for your favorable consideration of it. I just wanted to speak for a, a minute about um, how collaboration is the result of this project and to thank the people that were involved in it. Uh, it begins with Dubuque Initiatives, a private nonprofit organization that owns some of the property. In fact, is the owner of this property uh, until the transfer to, to Geisler Brothers. Um, Dubuque Initiatives sold a lot uh, adjacent to Chavanel and, uh, and Northwest Arterial uh, to, me to medical associates, and that has since been graded. But there was a significant cut that had to take place in that property, and they needed a place to take it. And the closest distance is the lowest cost option. And that closest distance happened to be behind Geisler Brothers in a drainage area that was owned by Dubuque Initiatives. Uh, then there was collaboration between now Bard Industries, which owns the lot to the north, Wright Height, which said, yeah, that's okay, you could use that ditch if you want to, and Geisler Brothers reimbursing medical associates to bring the fill in to that ditch to make a lot that was usable then for Geisler Brothers to expand their operation and create jobs in Dubuque. So I just want the citizens of Dubuque to know that the city manager's office, uh, the city engineer's office, uh, planning, all helped to make this happen. Medical Associates was a key, Geisler Brothers was a key, Bard, Wright Height was a key. Everybody working together to create a parcel of land and create jobs in Dubuque. And I just wanted to thank everybody involved and thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much, Rick. Any other comments this evening? Okay, just a, real quick, this is actually not on this particular subject, but the doors in the back keep closing and opening again. Does anybody know? <laughs> it's a little bit distracting and it keeps thumping like that, so I think it's distracting people as we're talking too. Is there, this is one of those nights that, um, be nice to have Mike sitting right there. <laughs> <laughs> So as we work on that, th yeah, thank you, Chief, for taking a look at that. But I just wanted to see if there's any way we could, we could deal with that particular problem. Um, okay, any other comments on this particular item for public hearing? Okay, anybody virtual? No one virtually. All right, then I'm gonna bring it back to the table. Any discussion? All right, hearing none, I think, um, you know, the, the, I, I appreciate the comments from Mr. Dickinson. I think this is uh, one of those places where it's important to point out. You don't look at an area like this on a map and realize everything that goes into making something like this happen sometimes. And I think that's an important part of the story. So I appreciate that context. I think it's very helpful to know that. Um, I think, you know, it seems from, I'm guessing here, at least from the lack of discussion that we may have general consensus, it seems like a pretty good use of this, but I know I plan to vote for this as well. All right, so we have a motion uh, by Jones and a second by Resnick to receive and 
file, waive the three readings. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move final consideration and passage of the ordinance. Second. A motion by Jones and a second by Resnick. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Public hearing number three is recommendation for approval of an amended lease with the Dubuque Racing Association. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Sprank. I motion that we receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second. And a motion by Sprank and a second by Roussel. Grana. The City of Dubuque and the Dubuque Racing Association entered into a second amended and restated lease agreement on January 4th of 2022. The parties now present an amendment to the second amended and restated lease agreement for City Council consideration. While the bulk of the lease will remain as is, there are several provisions which will be modified. It. Modified. The changes include the following. One, the termination date will be extended from 2036 to 2055. Two, references to dog racing and dog racing related requirements are removed as dog racing operations ceased in the summer of 2022. Three, the distribution of net cash proceeds is modified to clarify fiscal year information as the city and the Dubuque Racing Association use different fiscal years. Four, the January 2022 lease contemplated a separate entity for managing the distributions going towards implementation of the Schmidt Island Master Plan. <clears throat> After meeting with tax consultants, this is not an option, so the funds will be managed by a committee of the Dubuque Racing Association. Five, membership of the committee is specified to include the city manager and at least one city council member, which can be filled by the mayor if the mayor is currently serving on the board of the Dubuque Racing Association. Six, for FY23 only, up to $1.5 million of the cash reserve fund may be used toward a down payment on a construction loan incurred by the Dubuque Racing Association. And seven, for FY22 only, $2.5 million may be used by the Dubuque Racing Association to fund capital improvements. This payment was included in the annual DRA budget as a debt payment, but the debt has not yet been issued, so now it will be used to reduce the amount of debt issued in 2023 or as a debt payment in 2023. This amendment is subject to approval by the City Council and final approval by the Iowa Racing and Gaming Commission. Um, and a thank you to DRA President and CEO Alex Dixon and DRA Attorney Tanya Trom for their assistance in negotiating this agreement. The city manager, uh, Michael Van Milligan, and I respectfully recommend approval of the lease uh, amendment, and I believe Alex also has a brief presentation. Okay. I'm gonna, I'll go ahead and open it up for, um, for public comment, and then Alex, I'll invite you out. So uh, we are in a public hearing to consider council approval of an amendment to the second amended and restated lease agreement with the Dubuque Racing Association, and the city attorney and city manager are recommending approval. So, Alex, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, again, uh, President and CEO at uh, Q Casino DRA, uh, Alex Dixon, um, at 251 Hidden Oaks here in Dubuque. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you, uh, Mayor and Council Members uh, and City Staff. Um, it's been uh, quite a year um, at the Dubuque Racing Association. We're very proud of, uh, of the development tonight. Uh, really, as, as stated, uh, uh, it's the next step um, uh, in our process uh, as we look to uh, refurbish uh, not only the Greyhound racing area, but uh, the casino itself. Um, there may, I, I don't know if there are materials included. Let me see if I can pull it up. Are you, okay, here we go. Yeah. Okay, great. So just uh, very briefly, uh, as you all know, we have a, a, a great relationship with you as the council. Uh, we've been very fortunate for you all uh, have visited with you personally down on Schmidt Island as well as within Q Casino. Um, uh, you have listed uh, Schmidt Island as a top priority, and we're extremely grateful. Um, and uh, you approved the Schmidt Island Master Plan that uh, implied uh, several hundred million dollars of development uh, um, in 2014. 
Uh, and then as we uh, move forward, we've been able to establish a, a tremendous relationship with city staff. Uh, we meet uh, literally every week, um, and, uh, and for Marie, multiple times throughout the, the course of the day, um, often about the many assets that we um, help to run uh, uh, together. But city staff has advocated for uh, six million improvements to the community ice center. Uh, the, the, our, our staff, we continue to meet weekly. Uh, we constantly seek state and federal funds uh, to advance Schmidt Island, um, and we've designated Schmidt Island within an opportunity zone. Uh, these are all things that are going to really help uh, to transform this area, and it couldn't be done without partnership uh, with, with both the council as well as staff. So a quick just, just update on the, on the lease. Uh, thank you, Corinna, stated very well, but I think what's important on this next slide is really to, to kind of outline um, what we see moving forward. Um, and this is a chart that really just shows how this business is performing. And what's, what's best uh, is to really um, to, to reiterate to, uh, to the citizens of Dubuque, and which the council knows very well, is that uh, the performance of the Q as well as the DRA with the contribution from Diamond Joe really helps to, to buy down property taxes here in the community as well as make reinvestments. Uh, and so the green bars uh, showcase, starting back in 2017, uh, the amount of cash flow that was produced by uh, the DRA. And as you can see, we were trailing in around 13 million, popped up to 15, uh, and then in 2020, uh, as a result of the, uh, of the pandemic, really had a dramatic reduction. Um, but following uh, uh, the pandemic in 2021 and now hanging on through 2022, uh, we've seen a tremendous uptick in our business, largely because our expense structure uh, has come down. There are some things that we're just doing a, a bit smarter. Revenues have also helped. Um, but what's important, as you could imagine, for any facility, uh, it is important to reinvest uh, in that facility to make sure that you can kind of continue to grow. Uh, and so we're at this inflection point where there are a lot of unknowns at the macro level, uh, but what we do know is that there will be increased competition, whether that be in Wisconsin, Illinois, uh, even potentially in Cedar Rapids, uh, um, that will help, that will impact the, the broader Dubuque gaming market. Uh, and so we have a choice, uh, not much different than the choice we described before, is that we can either do nothing and harvest our cash flows for as long as possible, or we can choose to reinvest not only in our facility, but in our community to bring amenities that will help drive people, help grow our economy, and really give folks um, not only something to do, but uh, helping to us to be able to retract, uh, excuse me, retain uh, many of our, our, our people here within the community. And so what is outlined here is uh, the green, again, are actuals. The uh, red is a, a trend line of what we think um, this business may do if we do nothing, meaning if we don't make substantial improvements to the casino, if we don't grow, if we don't repurpose uh, the Greyhound racing area. Uh, and what you can see is, is not a doomsday scenario. Um, it is, we're just reverting back to what we were before. Um, but what I think we all want and know is that we want to continue to grow as a community, to thrive, and quite frankly, to continue to make sure that we're able to buy down property taxes at the rate that we're doing, because that allows us as a community to grow and move. So then what the yellow shows is just a very modest projections of what we may believe that we'll be able to achieve. And we'll get in further later down the line as to what we will build and what things will look like. But really today, this is about the building blocks to make sure that we're able to take those positive steps next forward. And so as you can see, what we're projecting is at a minimum just to be able to keep at these record highs that we're able to be here. Now, if we're able to do um, the development that, again, we'll disclose at a later time, uh, what you can see is that there's a big difference between doing nothing and making sure that we reinvest. So really, wh wh where are we and what's the road ahead? Um, so the first step, uh, as we went through this process at the, date, at the DRA, is that we needed to engage our DRA board, engage Dubuque initiatives, as well as our broader city leadership uh, and within the community. And so we've done that. Uh, second, we needed to improve our collateral package. And so a bit of what you'll hear in this lease tonight is by saving money this year from debt that we didn't issue uh, will help us to improve when we go to a bank to be able to loan money. Um, if you have a higher down payment, you'd be able to get a better rate. And so that's a, a big portion of what we're talking about tonight. 
The next is to refine scope. I think uh, for uh, any developer or any community, uh, uh, as it was outlined within the master plan, there's a lot of pretty pictures, there's a lot of things that we could do. Um, and for those of us who, who sat on the, on the DRA board or involved in the process, is that you've seen we started big about with what's the art of the possible, but then you have to start at one place. And so we've done that. We've refined our project scope to something not only that we can afford, um, but that is gonna help us to be able to move forward. Next, uh, we developed a construction budget. Um, so in this case, we've worked with Origin, we worked with um, RDG, we've worked with um, Conlon um, to be able to come up with a construction budget. And then, as you saw on the previous page, we needed to refine it and calibrate that financial return so that we have a good understanding of how much we can make into the future. And now we're at this uh, very important stage is that we need to secure the financing. Uh, and that's a combination which is uh, really unique for us of municipal, private, uh, hopefully knock on wood destination Iowa, uh, and a longer term is unlocking the potential of the opportunity zone where we sit. Uh, and then once we do that, and tonight is a very important step of that securing the fin financing, is we will then begin uh, implementing a phased master plan. So uh, the highlights, a um, uh, uh, subset of which uh, Krenna already outlined, is really this uh, reduces $2.5 million in future debt obligations uh, for our upcoming remodel and development. Uh, we extend this lease term um, to December 31st, 2055, and really that enables us to amortize debt over a 30-year period. And so what I think is really important is that as we now take on an ambitious project, uh, this is, think of it no different than home economics. If you were to buy a new home, you would want to be able to take out a 30-year mortgage. Um, and so although DRA does not own the land, we can unlock value within our entire enterprise by uh, extending our partnership that has been very fruitful for the city. Um, uh, as you know, our contributions to the city so far this year are up 40% over last year. Um, on the flip side, we are very grateful that you allowed us um, uh, to reinvest one third of those profits into Schmidt Island. Um, but this extends the lease for, so that when we go to our banking partners, we have the ability to take um, uh, debt out that can then be amortized uh, up to 30 years. Um, and so with that, um, I'll uh, feel free to answer any questions, but are very grateful for the partnership that you all uh, continue to help lead the way for us. All right, thank you very much, Alex. Appreciate it. Um, let's see, anybody else have any other comments before I bring it back to the table? Anybody virtually at all? Oh, I'm sorry, they're conferring over there. Adrian, do we have any virtual comments at all? No one virtually. Okay, all right. Then to the table. Any discussion? I thought maybe Alex was going to leave us speechless yet again. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Resnick. Well, thank you very much. I just didn't want uh, there to be uh, no comments. Uh, I know that Mr. Mayor was going to give some good comments, but uh, I do want to double down on what Mr. Dixon talked about. We all were down there. We've been looking at this for a long time. He's interested in something that's good for the citizens of Dubuque, as we are. So we have this mutual... Uh, thing about the citizens of Dubuque uh, getting the best deal they can. So I wanted to say thank you to you and your team for coming to this. Uh, I think it is a good plan and I hope we go through with it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Mr. Yeah. Mayor? Yeah, Ms. Farber. Yes, I just wanted to also um, appreciate very much the discussion that Alex has shared with us. And also, I think it's important to highlight the point of exchange or um, extending the lease to 20, I think 2055 uh, in order to um, create that 30 year window for the mortgages or any of the loans that he so is able to acquire by the investment industry. I think that's going to be a key success factor uh, in terms of uh, being good guardians. Uh, of the cash flow and being very prudent with the money. So I think it's, it's a, a good thing to do. So thank you very much for your, bringing that to our attention. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Wethel, now we're going. <laughs> so as I heard Susan speak, I wanted to just relay that I do not work in finance or business as my profession. 
And so as I had the privilege to serve my constituents, I have learned a great deal about what the DRA and Q Casino mean to Dubuque. And so when we make this decision collectively to make these changes, we are investing in ourselves. And we are investing in making sure we buy down our property tax. And we are truly benefiting our community in meaningful ways, in ways that I really, truly didn't understand. Um, and so I appreciate the relationship and the collaboration and what it means to our citizens um, every day. So thanks for your work. Thank you. Mr. Sprink. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you to Alex and, of course, city staff for all this. It's a lot of hard work putting together. Um, we're going to be eventually talking about another project about improvements. Um, and you've been in the, the gaming industry for quite some time. How often does a casino do this type of facelift or remodel? Is it like every five, a, 10 that's years? That's a great question. Uh, kind of general rule, rule of thumb is every five to seven years, you want to be doing some form of a, um, a, a pr pretty extensive refurbishment. Uh, to the extent that we're talking about now, this is this. I would say at, at this level, every ten to fifteen years is pro, you know about uh, on average. But uh, our hotel rooms, for instance, every five to seven, you always want to do a refresh uh, within there. Uh, but the the type of development that we're talking about, um, really uh, at this extensive, more so to ten to fifteen years. We're essentially due for it. We are. It's been about fifteen years since the last kind of major. Uh, major renovation and, and re remodel. Uh, we paid off the debt from the previous remodel, and guess what? It's time to uh, remodel again. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, um, I, I don't know if anybody's noticed, but we've been talking about the DRA a lot this year. This has been a this has been a discussion that we've had quite a bit. Um, Alex, you're here. I see Kathy Burr in the in the back there. Um, you know, your team at the DRA. It is impossible, I think, to overstate the importance of the excitement and the innovation that you and your team have brought to this discussion. And I thank you for it um, as, as mayor, but also just as a, as a resident of Dubuque. I, I totally agree. I think this is an incredibly important investment in who we are as a city. It's unique to Dubuque. We need to capitalize on that in, in the best ways that we can. And I think that we're doing that. Um, I, I think this lease is a, you know, we've, we've hashed out um, a couple of different amendments to the DRA lease as a city this year. Um, and it's been hard work. Um, but it's very much worth it. You know, I, I had to smile a little bit when you were talking about the, uh, the, the visioning process, and then we talk about the, the squeeze, basically, trying to think about, like, we gotta get down into the details and really think about what this is. We're in the hard stuff now, uh, but I, I commend you and, and uh, everyone who's been working on this, uh, City Attorney Brumwell, our city manager, everybody who's been involved. It's, it's really important um, that we make sure that we, we keep moving this forward in these exciting ways. I think this is, uh, I think this is a, great, a great move in the right direction, so great. thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, seeing no further comments, we have a motion by Sprank and a second by Roussel to receive and file and adopt this resolution. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Public hearing number four is public hearing and approval of Plaza Drive Urban Revitalization Plan. Mr. Mayor? Ms. Roussel? I move to receive and file. And further move that a requirement that a proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed be suspended. Second by Wethel. And a motion by Roussel. Second by Wethel. Crenna. Uh, Housing and Community Development Director Alexis Steger is recommending City Council approve the Plaza Drive Urban Revitalization Plan and District Designation. The development plan for the lot in the proposed district provides for the construction of 390 units of multi-residential market rate workforce housing. This will be constructed by Talon Development in 13 three-story buildings and will include community amenities such as a pool and dog park. The city manager concurs with the recommendation and respectfully requests mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Krenna. We are in a public hearing to consider city council approval of the Plaza Drive Urban Revitalization Plan and district designation, and the city manager is recommending approval. Um, is there anyone in chambers to address us on this item? Do we have anyone virtually? No one virtually. Okay, back to the table then. Mm -hmm. 
Seeing no discussion here. Ms. Farber, do you have anything? No, I do not. Thank you. All right, thank you. Then we have a motion by Roussel and a second by Wethel to receive and file. Receive and file and waive the three readings. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Mr. Mayor? Ms. Roussel? I move final consideration and passage of the ordinance. Second. Second by Wethel. Excuse me. <laughs> I've got a motion by Roussel and a second by Wethel. Um, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. We will move on to public input. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting may address the City Council on the action items on the agenda or on matters under the control of the City Council. For all in-person attendees, please approach the podium and state your name and address. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Individual remarks are limited to five minutes and the overall public input period is limited to 30 minutes. Under the Iowa Open Meetings Law, the City Council can take no form formal action on comments given during public input or that do not relate to the action items on the agenda. All right, thank you, Adrian. Do we have any public input this evening? Hello, uh, I'm Dave Overby. Can you hear me? Uh, okay. Thank you. Mayor Kavanaugh, Council. Uh, this may be an inappropriate approach. Uh, approach, a uh, uh, request. Real quick, Dave. I'm sorry, uh, address too. We need your address before What's you that? get rolling. Your, your home address. Oh, yep. my home address, 13078 Swiss Valley Road, not in Dubuque, but. That's all right. All right, thank you very much. Okay. Um, so I sent you copies, most of you copies of uh, a proposal or some information that I found out recently. And I also handed out more tonight that has more uh, background information. Okay, so what this is is the uh, notice of uh, uh, funding opportunities from the Federal Railway Administration for passenger trains. Uh, the, uh, it was uh, published in the Federal Register, which you have the first page uh, of that on uh, December 7th. And this process will end March, uh, uh, yeah, March 7th. So there's not a lot of time to, to, to deal with this. Um, there's uh, $36 billion available for the whole country, uh, $24 billion for the uh, nor Northeast uh, Corridor along the East Coast. $12 billion for the rest of us. And as of uh, the date that I have, there's already been 3,807 requests for information. So uh, you have a lot of competition. Um, now this, this has to do with a couple other projects that are going on. One project, <coughs> and that's uh, stated in this uh, little thing I gave you, uh, was funded by the Illinois DOT for the Rockford Buke passenger train project. Uh, that was only funded for the first step. There are five steps. The Illinois DOT said, forget it, you're done. So that process is pretty much dead. Uh, the other project is, some of you know from DMATS, that the Ride to Rail uh, organization in town, and I'm not speaking for them, I'm speaking just for myself, um, is working on a corridor ID program. And that was announced in May, and the, uh, uh, it closed in November. So we missed the boat on that one too. Okay, so what, what's left is this, uh, one coming up, you have two months to, to get a, a, a few million dollars. All right. 
Uh, that's about it. My f five minutes is about up. If you want to read that, give me some information. Uh, oh, one, one question was brought up. Why is the council, why am I asking a council to do this, not the uh, ECIA? Because they have so much on their plate, they, all can, they, they won't be able to even start this process. Now, will you? I don't know. It's, it's take, you have to have partnership, probably partnership with the IODOT, Illinois DOT, all the communities along, along the route, including Waterloo, Mason City, if we go that way. So there's not a lot of time. There's a lot of money, but not a lot of time. And the other thing? I can, time's up. All right. Well, thank, thank you, you very much, Dave. Appreciate your comments. You any others this evening? All right, seeing no others here, do we have any virtual public input? No one virtually, but I will note for the record that regarding action item number one, Joel Pusateri and T. Hewson of 1165 Bluff Street submitted input. All right, thank you very much. Then we can go ahead and move on. We'll move on to action items. Action item number one is Five Flags Improvement Project. Mr. Jones. Move to receive and file the documents and adopt the resolution. Second. A motion by Jones and a second by Roussel. Corinna, please. After four years of study and public input, the Mayor and City Council at the December 5th, 2022 work session, consistent with a recommendation from the Five Flags Center Advisory Commission, asked that an agenda item be created for the December 19th, 2022 City Council meeting to implement an approximately 24 million Five Flags improvement project that is to be funded by downtown urban renewal debt budgeted through the city capital improvement budget process. It is the intent that the project shall be done in a manner that does not preclude a future project to create an indoor outdoor venue on the north end of the building, which will require future budgeted funds to accomplish. After approval of the five-year capital improvement program in March 2023, city staff will work with the Five Flag Center Advisory Commission, architects and engineers and uh, to recommend to the mayor and council specific capital projects to be implemented. It is anticipated that these $24 million in projects will be completed in phases over the next five years. The Five Flags Civic Center Advisory Commission has been dedicated to the improvement of Five Flags. They advocated with the City Council the importance of the Civic Center to the community and the need for improvements of both the historic theater and the Five Flags Civic Center, even before it became a City Council priority, and more so after it was set as a priority. Each commissioner took their role to listen to residents and advise the City Council very seriously at every step along this journey. They were heavily involved in the engagement of residents. This engagement assisted in every step of studies that were complete and will be important to the design of the improvement project to be brought back to the City Council after the FY24 budget process is complete in March of 2023. Thank you to the current and past commissioners for their tenacity, extra time, and commitment to Five Flags. ASM Global is the city's management services firm for the Five Flags Civic Center. The staff at Five Flags, as well as the corporate ASM Global staff, have shared expertise that has assisted the city during each step of this journey as well. Whether it was sharing data and information with consultants or sitting at a table with draft designs, evaluating revenue potentials for specific improvements, or marketing engagement opportunities for residents, they have been a true partner from day one. Additional partners that have supported the process included Dubuque Main Street, the Dubuque Area Chamber of Commerce, Travel Dubuque, Main Street Businesses, the Dubuque Symphony, Fly By Night Productions, and others. Their insights and expertise have been invaluable. Numerous residents were also involved in writing letters, making phone calls, coming to meetings, and answering surveys. Their input shaped where we are today and will influence the improvement project moving forward. Budget and Finance Director Jennifer Larson provided financial information and reviewed numerous scenarios related to debt and financing and the effect of those on property taxes. Without Jennifer's expertise, none of this could have been possible. 
The city manager offers a sincere thank you to Leisure Services Manager Marie Ware, who brought this project through the many studies over the last several years, coming to numerous meetings to prevent information and to answer questions. Marie's work is why this is still a viable project today and why we will now have a facility that greatly improves the customer and performer experience. The city manager respectfully recommends mayor and city council adoption of the enclosed resolution. Thank you very much, Krenna. Any discussion? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I, I'm almost giddy about this, finally getting a vote and getting some motion to it. Um, we, we suffered, frankly, a few years of analysis paralysis as we looked at this thing and looked at this thing, and then we got kicked in the hind end pretty hard by COVID-19. And then a new reality kind of set in on the city council and, and on all of us. And somehow through all of that, I think we landed in the, at the best possible solution. Um, part of what's happening here tonight is we're turning the question upside down. The, the question we'd worked on and worked on and worked on is um, show us what a spectacular build would be and then show us what it would cost and then we'll figure out how to pay for it. Well, now we're, we've turned the question upside down that now we have uncommitted funds um, that we already own that doesn't require new debt issuance um, that doesn't require an increase in property tax. We can instead say, here's a block of money. Show us what could be done with that. And I think that the result is going to be what the city needs. I think that we've had uh, um, the guy that I leaned on the most, um, who actually operates a civic center, or at least did for us, was HR. When he told us we could have great success with a boutique-sized arena um, with some good amenities. And I think that's exactly where we can land is, is within that vision that he shared with us at this council table. Um, so there's a lot of work in front of this thing um, still to come, but a ton of it done. And this is a major, major milestone. Can't wait to vote yes and move this along. Let me also say that when the referendum happened in 1972-73 to build a Five Flags Civic Center in the first place, it was a given that it would cost continual investment in order to operate the thing. Just like Eagle Point Park costs us money, just like our trail system and our pools and our ice arena and other municipal facilities that are built for the pleasure and enjoyment of the citizens that elevate the quality of life for all of us. Um, and the arts are core to who we are in Dubuque. And this center is all about the arts and the production of entertainment for, for the community. So it's every bit as important to the community. And I, I get that some people don't use it. There's some people don't use the park system. Um, many people don't use a lot of things, but all those things are there for many people. And it comes back to the conversation we had an hour ago about being a place that people want to live, about being a place that attracts young talent to come to Dubuque, Iowa, and look around and say, wow, I'm staying here. So this is a big piece of that puzzle as well. So let's go. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Mr. Sprank. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, yeah, uh, couldn't echo. You said it very well, Mr. Jones. My biggest thing, my biggest thing I want to say is thank you to Marie Ware for all the effort that's gone into this, and there's going to be a lot more coming forward. So I view this 24 million as a start to the improvements. Um, it's you know it's time to move forward on fixing what we have. Uh, we need to use these funds to update a very well-used facility that is 20 years overdue for updates. So I'm going to support this wholeheartedly. Thank you. Thank you. Did I see your hand, Ms. Bethel? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, I also want to thank the commission and <clears throat> Ms. Ware for the years of work, of time and talent and commitment. And for the commission, this is really the beginning for them in some ways, because now they have a lot of decision making to do as far as recommendations. And so I really am looking forward to that. Um, I undoubtedly will support the funding. I'm excited to do it. 10 years from now, though, we need to be looking at long term strategies for collaborative funding in my eyes. Um, that may not create the only burden of the support for our taxpayers, but for others in our community. I think every business leader and organization of our community should participate, and I hope they'll reflect on the value of performing arts as a performing arts center and consider how it creates revenue for their own businesses in downtown Dubuque, 
how it contributes to the quality of life as a measurement that nurtures the lives of their employees. Appleton, Wisconsin. It's a town of 74,000 people, and it has the Fox Cities Performing Arts Center that opened in 2002. At the time, it cost $45 million to build. In 2021, that would be $70.8 million. It was created as a sustained collaborative within their community. Millions of dollars were donated to the fund of the facility, uh, to fund the facility for the community partners. The community partners included Thrivent Financial, Kimberly Clark Corporation, local foundations, professionals, and businesses that gave generously. Municipalities included hotel motel tax. There were many people at the table. So now the hard work begins. And while our Civic Center Commission is helping to make recommendations on how our investment best serves our patrons and this community, I feel that it is our job to work on a financially sustainable model that will include the philanthropy of our very generous community members. We will need you for the future of the facility. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Roussel. Yes, thank you. In listening to the annual reports from Five Flags for the past few years, I know that Five Flags is an amenity that's used by people of all ages, of all income levels, people who live here, people who come here from outside our community to attend the amazing variety of events that are provided there. And the economic impact is well documented. But in order to continue to make this amenity available to our community and viable for the future, I know there are many enhancements and improvements, including safety issues, that need to be addressed. And I base that opinion on many things, including our recent tour, the regular reports that we receive, and the fact that I performed at Five Flags in both the theater and the arena as part of the symphony for many years, and I've attended events there as well. I also know that the technology has changed since the 70s, and we need to upgrade to continue to be attractive to the events that we want to provide. If we want to provide to attract and retain the workforce we need, it's imperative that Dubuque offers a wide array of amenities, including Five Flags. Not every amenity in a community is used by every resident, as Mr. Jones uh, referred to, but in order to have a vibrant community, our mission statement says that we will offer an abundance of diverse and fun things to do. So for example, I, I might not go to the skate park myself, but that doesn't mean we don't need one. And right now we have an excellent and win-win opportunity to make this happen without increasing taxes. And the timing is perfect to enhance the vibrant downtown cultural corridor, along with the upcoming multi-million dollar art museum campus just a few blocks away. So I'm excited to support this plan and finally get moving forward on Five Flags. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned that it was my experience uh, talking, to, um, talking to citizens over the past 10 years or so that uh, they really love Five Flags Theater, and they like the Civic Center. Well, um, we can't pull down the Civic Center and leave the Five Flags Theater by itself. You know, to support this wonderful theater, this is not a standalone facility. It must have financial and logistical support. And what's the best partner for this wonderful theater that we have? Well, it's the... Um, the, the, by the way, as, as mentioned here, the theater showcases dramas, orchestral music, and other arts events. The best partner is an updated entertainment venue that people really want to go to, right? Everything is modernized and everything works. Wouldn't that be nice? And this is what we are we're voting for tonight. Um, we're not spending $92 million, not $74 million. Those were the, uh, as mentioned before, some of the uh, early numbers that just didn't feel right to a lot of people, and it surely didn't feel right to, to me. Uh, I, I like that we're keeping the same footprint, 
and we are really putting that uh, $24 million into a right-sized facility for Dubuque, Iowa. It may be planned to be optional expansion uh, in lay, uh, for later, but uh, right now, that's what we need, uh, something, a, a great project like this um, that we don't have to, I mean, uh, talking to citizens right now, no one's saying, oh, guess what? They're saving $50 million. That's not what I'm hearing. <laughs> I'm hearing we're still spending $24 million, uh, which is absolutely true. We have to be careful about how we spend the money. I think this is the best way to do it. I have received some excellent suggestions from citizens how to improve our beautiful theater, uh, and I will send those on uh, to the city manager if this is approved tonight. Um, again, uh, it's been mentioned here that we will continue to seek private donors and other private entities to contribute to this. Um, there, are, there is a lot of uh, community in this uh, Five Flag Civic Center. We have so many events that go on uh, there that don't cost money, that we open up the building and facility for the public. So yes, there are paid uh, events, obviously, um, but again, my heart is with the theater, and this is what the theater needs, and there's a lot going on there that people will want to see. Uh, finally, uh, Mr. Mayor, I want to add my voice to the special thanks to our Five Flags Advisory Commission for all the work that they've done that, uh, as well as our, our wonderful staff here. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, can I add just one more comment? Uh, sure, Mr. President. A couple of people, a number of people suggested, why don't you just sell it to the private sector and let them make money at it? Well, if you've been paying attention to what the private sector is doing in Dubuque, they build a lot of car washes, which apparently make money. And believe me, if, if a civic center made money, they'd be building civic centers and not car washes. It's just an economic fact. Ms. Farber, would you like to jump in at all? Yeah, I, well, first off, I, I appreciate all the major points in the discussion um, of my council colleagues. And so I think my major points have already been shared. Um, tonight, but I do look forward to uh, working with Marie and the commission on defining and setting up the improvement phases for the project and how we will go about that rotation. And I think um, it's going to be very important that we keep uh, the, the uh, facility open uh, during the restoration so that we can generate revenues uh, and keep it um, operational. And also, I would like to give a shout out to Marie um, and actually HR as well and all of the staff for this work. It's been an ongoing project for a number of years and we greatly appreciate all that they have done. So thank you. Thank you. Well, I personally have lost count of the number of times that we've talked about Five Flags. Um, we've been talking about it constantly since I've, been, uh, since I've had the pleasure to serve on this council. Um, I honestly think that at the end of this discussion tonight, I am out of things to say about Five Flags until we talk about it again in March. So I'm very excited to vote um, for this and move this forward. The one thing I, I do wanna make sure I say is thank you. Thank you to some very key people. Um, Marie and your staff, Leisure Services, incredible work getting us to this point. Uh, Jennifer Larson and the finance staff getting us to this point. Aaron Rainey, uh, our new executive uh, director over there at uh, um, ASM Global, managing the Five Flag Center, and of course your predecessor HR. Thank you to you and your team, primarily for your patience. I, I can only imagine the patience it has required of you to get to this point with us, but thank you for sticking around. Um, we really do wanna move forward with you and we're, we're happy to, to see you there. Um, also want to thank just um, the Five Flags uh, Commission, uh, Five Flags Civic Center Commission, uh, also for patience and uh, for understanding, you know, we, we have been listening to you. We, we absolutely have been paying attention to what you've had to say. And it's been a difficult discussion and we're glad that you've stuck with us to, to keep doing this. We, we want to continue in that partnership. And then every single one of the city staff members who have been a part of this as well, and along with my city council colleagues, thank you. Um, looking forward to moving forward and uh, continuing this discussion in a couple of months. So with that, <coughs> we have a motion by Jones and a second by Roussel to receive and file and adopt this resolution. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Action item number two is Dubuque's Cultural and Entertainment District Presentation. Need a motion, please. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Shaw. 
I move to receive and file and view the presentation. Second. And a motion by Russell, second by Jones. I'm going to. While she's getting that up, I'll just read Brenna. the short little memo here. Thank you. Economic Development Director Jill Connors, Arts and Cultural Affairs Manager Jenny Peterson Brandt, and Planning Services Manager Wally Wernemont are sharing information on Dubuque's cultural and entertainment district, its history, benefits, and the future. Did I buy enough time? I think you did. Thank you very much, <laughs> Greta. Good job. Jill Connors, Economic Development Director. Speaking of arts, here we are. We're going to try to keep it short because it's been a long night for you already and you've got more to go. And I'm the least qualified person to speak to you about this. But we wanted to share with you in light of um, Five Flags, in light of the bold plans of the Art Museum right now, um, of all the initiatives going on in the Millwork District along the Central Avenue Corridor, we wanted to let you know that the City of Dubuque since 2004 has had a large portion of our downtown designated by the state of Iowa as a cultural and entertainment district. And I'm gonna let Wally Wernemont take it from here. We will try to keep it to 10 minutes, but we'll see what happens. No, that's all right, we appreciate, we know we have a lot of work ahead of us. We're packing a lot in at the end of the year here, so it's understandable. We appreciate you being here. Yes, a fine introduction from Economic <laughs> Development Director Jill Connors for you. So uh, back in 2004, I was a wee lad working for the city as an alone assistant planner. <laughs> no, um, so I actually started working for the city back in 2001, and this was actually one of my projects that I worked on initially. So I'm your history guy, of course. So um, as Jill has indicated, back in 2004, the um, Department of Cultural Affairs created this program. It's a great resource. It's to help identify and recognize the concentration of collected impacts of areas of our arts, culture, and entertainment assets located throughout um, not only our city, but cities across the state of Iowa. And when this was established, I don't think anyone on the council was on the council back in 2004. So this is kind of provide some of that information that um, Jill was talking about, provide an update, what it is and where we're going from there. So trailblazing, when we applied, we always like to be first, right? We were one of first of uh, the original eight that were established and we were actually by far the largest district uh, based on square footage wise, and I'll show you that in, the f in a few minutes here, actually a few seconds probably, um, of the, uh, the map of the area. But these are the areas that are currently uh, designated. There are 16 districts across the state, and we're uh, fortunate to be one of those. Um, so in 2018, the city worked with Dubuque Main Street to be redesignated. Every 10 years, you have to redesignate your property. Um, as you noticed, it was 2004, but in 2018, we redesignated it. We did try just to get the Millwork District as a separate district back in 2014. However, there wasn't a lot of amenities associated with there, so it didn't rise to that occasion. So what do we do? We're just gonna add the Millwork District to our much larger district to really be established. In addition to including um, uh, the areas you know, along Bluff Street and everything um, to the south, and in addition to that Flatiron Park development. Um, here's a map of the area. There's a lot on here, and I actually created this a long time ago. Um, so in your pack, you'll see there's a list of all the different resources and locations and events and um, buildings and everything that's associated with it. So um, believe it or not, it's almost our entire downtown core, and it corresponds with the Dubuque Main Street Limited uh, service boundaries. Um, there's a lot of things going on, and it's a great thing to be able to identify that our entire downtown is a cultural corridor. Um, that's a great asset to our community, and I'm going to hand it off to Jenny Peterson Brand, who will be able to touch on quite a few of those benefits. So, thanks. Gotta adjust that height there. Hello, uh, Jenny Peterson Brandt, Arts and Cultural Affairs Manager for the City of Dubuque. I'm gonna speak a little bit about what the Cultural Entertainment District uh, means in terms of broader impacts for the community of Dubuque, um, what it means for us to have secured that designation uh, and to maintain that designation. So as noted by the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs, uh, its Cultural and Entertainment District program acknowledges that the presence of arts and cultural opportunities enhance property values 
increase profitability of surrounding businesses, and expand the tax base of that area. Districts attract a diverse and engaged workforce, something that is key uh, as an incentive for attracting new and helping to entice uh, businesses to relocate to our community and to that area. Cultural and entertainment districts also work to attract residents and tourists who support adjacent businesses, such as restaurants, lodging facilities, rental, or sorry, retail stores, and other entertainment venues in the area. So just as we were speaking about the Five Flags Civic Center and the Five Flags Historic Theater downtown, we know that that as a facility has huge impacts for the restaurants and other um, spaces and uh, private for-profit entities that are in that area. Uh, one other, th some other things to think about when it comes to cultural disti districts, and this is actually information that is taken from Americans for the Arts, an organization that we as the city of Dubuque are a member of. Um, Americans for the Arts additionally acknowledges that cultural districts are typically unique to the character, community, and resources that are available locally. Cultural districts tend to have significant economic impact on cities, attracting businesses, tourists, and local residents to a central part of that city. These cultural districts can help to revitalize neighborhoods and increase the quality of life for residents. Cultural and entertainment districts also serve as a vehicle to assist in the support and marketing of local nonprofit organizations. So within that map that Wally had just shared with us, I just wanna call out, um, I think Wally, is it something like 200, 200 cultural entertainment um, uh, arts assets are within that district map, but just a few of them to come to mind that have been mentioned here tonight um, include the Dubuque Museum of Art, the Grand Opera House, Five Flags with the expansion of the redesignation in 2018. It also includes the National Mississippi River Museum and Aquarium, and many, many, many more, of course. I'm not going to list all 200 of them. Um, cultural and entertainment districts also serve as a focal point to brand a city's unique cultural identity and embrace its historic, historic significance. One of the things I want to mention here is that within Dubuque's cultural and um, downtown cultural corridor district, that the, a lot of the activities that we are all very familiar with, including the Julian Dubuque Film Festival, um, performances by Fly By Night Production, we have Dubuque Fest happens in Washington Park, which is part of that cultural corridor. We have things like the Smokestack, the Latinx Festiva that happens, um, the Dubuque Symphony Orchestra, uh, performs the majority of its concerts in that area. We also have things like Manette Day, the historic Millwork District Night Markets. There's so many things to name that happen within our own cultural and entertainment district here in Dubuque. Um, sometimes these districts can have formal boundaries uh, that include specific zoning ordinances and economic tax incentives. And sometimes they might have more informal and official boundaries that become a focal point for marketing to cluster arts organizations and cultural institutions together. So when it comes to our designation with the state, um, some of the benefits that we actually receive as a uh, officially designated uh, cultural and entertainment district from the state of Iowa is we receive promotion of projects and incentives through their established communication channels, including their social media, their events calendars, and opportunity listings with the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs. We also receive professional development and networking opportunities through the Iowa Creative Place Cohort Network, including invitations to their annual Creative Places Exchange event, um, which again, that happens every year. And last year in 2021, myself and Laura Burtons from Dubuque Main Street had the opportunity to present and represent Dubuque in that exchange event. We also have access to branding assets and to signage along with also with, along with other technical assistance related to CED best practices and notification of applicable grant opportunities. I do wanna note here that with the CED designation, it does not come with any direct funding through that program from the state of Iowa. 
but it is something that we at the city and our other uh, arts and cultural partners often leverage and grant applications. I know that within the recent um, NEA funding that we had applied for and that we received through ARPA, that that was one of the things that we highlighted in that grant application and um, I'm sure helped us to secure that half a million dollar funding that we received. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our virtual presenter, John Berg, who is the program manager with the Arts and Community Development Program with the Iowa Department of Cultural Affairs. John, are you with us? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you, John. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to uh, Dubuque's efforts and designation as a Iowa Cultural and Entertainment District. Um, you know, I've heard uh, several council uh, members, including Mr. Jones, speak uh, several times this evening about the power of arts and culture and how that leads to not only attracting but it retaining uh, workforce. And so just to kind of talk a little bit about our mission uh, as the Department of Cultural Affairs and a little bit about, about our strategic plan from 2022 to 2026. We empower Iowans to create and sustain culturally vibrant communities by connecting with the people, places, and points of pride that define our state. Uh, some of our department priorities is that are part of this uh, strategic plan include cultivating and promoting creative places and growing Iowa's creative economy and workforce. And that also includes building the capacity of our cultural and organization, cultural organizations. We do a lot of work to, fo to feature and focus uh, our efforts on creative placemaking, which is really looking at how uh, it, it, those activities put all arts, culture, and heritage at the center of community economic development. So really through this program, we look to raise up these efforts and look beyond just one or two or three or four, or in Jenny's case in reference, 200 organizations within a cultural and entertainment district and uh, promote and encourage that collaboration and coordination locally so that those efforts can really uh, make a difference in attracting, retaining talent, not only uh, in general, but through the creative sectors in, in communities across the state of Iowa. Um, oftentimes, and since Dubuque was a trailblazer, that they are looked to as a leader in these efforts. So we, uh, we often promote a lot of the events that come out of the district that's coordinated by the Dubuque Main Street program and Laura um, over there. Um, but really looking forward to uh, continuing to share those efforts statewide and continue to work with Jenny and the Dubuque team um, on this and other efforts related to uh, cultural uh, history, culture, and creative placemaking in Dubuque. So thank you for this opportunity to talk. Thanks, John. Uh, I'm just gonna add a few more things and then I'll be turning it over to Danielle Jacobs with Dubuque Main Street. Uh, one of the other pieces that I wanted to call out um, because this is a Currently with the City Council Management and Progress item, the continued implementation of the City's Arts and Culture Master Plan, that when we look at the high level goals of that plan, there are a number of places where having this cultural corridor and maintaining that status uh, strongly aligns with that plan. So there's um, the, the top level goals of are related to economic development and involvement and participation. And then as we work down through the plan, uh, maintaining this cultural corridor designation aligns very specifically with um, uh, strategies that are speak to promoting and supporting arts and culture as Dubuque's competitive edge, along with fostering engagement at all levels and then cultivating connections throughout our communities and amongst our arts and cultural assets and arts and culture bearers in the community of Dubuque. And with that, I will turn it over to Danielle Jacobs with Dubuque Main Street. Well, hello. hello. Most of you I've met, for those I haven't, nice to meet you. As Jenny said, my name is Danielle Jacobs, and I'm the new executive director for Dubuque Main Street. 
Dubuque Main Street is the not-for-profit that acts as the liaison between the state's program and our city and businesses. So as Wally mentioned, our designation status is every 10 years, so we'll be reapplying in 2028. In addition to that, we report back to the state on an annual basis. It's a seven page document, give or take, that reports on uh, numerical data such as events and the 200 some businesses that are included in the district. We also talk about business openings, business closings. Thank you. We talk about boundary changes, updates to the advisory council, public access, information, community support details, local initiatives, and success stories. Laura was mentioned uh, a few times. She's our program coordinator with Dubuque Main Street, and she uh, attends monthly calls with all of the other districts. This allows us to share best practices and uh, connect with each other. Our most recent strategic plan, uh, which is in your packet, highlights uh, just some of the things uh, some of our initiatives that relate to the Alton Culture Corridor, such as hosting and advocating district events, promoting and advocating for local artists, promoting and advocating diverse cultural businesses, uh, using promoting a lot, you'll hear me say that a lot over the next year, um, advocating for district nightlife, recruiting creative entrepreneurs to the district, and guiding our community's creators to the statewide uh, district resources that are available. So you'll see a lot of activities and programs coming out of Dubuque Main Street in regard to art, arts and culture, all in an effort to make it more, a more vibrant place to be. So thank you for your time and attention tonight. Well, thank you all. Jill, Wally, Jenny, John, thank you very much for joining us virtually and sticking with us there. And Danielle, it's good to, good to hear from you as a, as a new director. So we really appreciate this. This is, a, I think, a very helpful presentation to be able to give us more context to what it means um, to have that, uh, <clears throat> that particular district here in town. So any, any questions or discussion? Uh, yep, Mr. Mayor, Resnick? I'm wondering if our designation helps us leverage any private or public funds uh, in the district to uh, uh, help individual um, uh, entities or uh, in general does our designation help bring in some dollars? That's my question. Yeah. We'll tag team you. We'll tag team on this one. Um, so, you know, I, I think this is one of the things that we, we don't necessarily know exactly for sure um, because a piece of that is looking to all of our arts and cultural assets in the community as they're applying for different grant opportunities, different funding opportunities, we don't necessarily have a complete handle on how they might be leveraging and using this. I know that we at the city use it as much as we can, as often as we're able to within the character counts of grant op opportunities. So um, that's my piece of the tag teaming. That's a great piece. <laughs> so uh, initially when it came out, it used to get additional point totals for grant applications for certain grants that we would apply for. Um, some of those grants would have a checkbox, say, are you part of a cultural and entertainment district? Um, so it's funny. So that was something that was an asset to help identify. And then plus, you know, like we talk about with the comprehensive plan and everything else that's associated with this, when we have our cultural and, cultural and arts plan, um, our equitable poverty production plan, it doesn't hurt, especially when we help assist um, individuals, and you're talking about private individuals and, and different groups, to be able to say, hey, I'm, I'm a contributing property um, business to this cultural entertainment district um, in order to help bolster their grant applications and associate with that, so. Thank you very much. Also, it puts us on the map, to be honest with you. So, um, like I mentioned, there's 16 designated districts. And then also, as we mentioned tonight, when we hear about thing, economic development, um, we're going to talk about historic preservation a little bit. We're going to talk about arts and culture. Um, that is an economic generator in our community and to be able to bring people to our community, spend their dollars, which help you know, benefit the city of Dubuque as a whole. So thanks. All right.
Well, thank you very much all for the presentation. We really appreciate it. So we have a motion by Roussel and a second by Jones um, to receive and file and hear that presentation. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. The motion passes 7-0. Action item number three is City of Dubuque programs that support historic preservation efforts. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. Move to receive and file and check out the presentation. Second. And a motion by Jones and a second by Resnick. Lexis, am I coming to you? All right. Lexis, it is. Good evening, City, uh, City Council, Mayor Alexis Sager, Housing and Community Development Director. Um, tonight we're going to talk a little bit about um, Dubuque's commitment to historic preservation. A lot of times we come before the council and we're asking about very specific buildings and we don't get to talk a lot about historic preservation as a whole and all of the efforts that we're doing all together at one time. Um, a lot of times that's because we're doing it independently. My department, Jill, Connors, Economic Development, and we're all just kind of bringing them as they come. Um, recently, Wally bringing the KC building to you. So we wanted to make sure that um, we got the opportunity to kind of bring it all together at the end of the year and um, talk a lot about what we've done as a city to commit to um, historic preservation as we balance the needs for affordable housing as well as economic development. So we're gonna start with the housing and community development uh, kind of summary for the year. Um, a lot of things that we do at the housing department kind of go down to the really small level, um, meaning that we do individual homes. Uh, we rehab very um, homeowners, how, um, ones that we do not own, ones that the city of Dubuque does own, but we get down to that residential level. Um, things that we do um, when this does happen is that historic preservation is at the forefront. Uh, we want to make sure that if a, if a home had double doors to begin with when it was built, that it gets back to that state. Um, if the, if it, the front porch has some historic uh, significance, make sure it stays there and make sure that it, it ha has the same features that it did before. So that is something that we do. Um, and so as you can see from before and after, we do keep all of those historic features, um, all the way down to paint types, um, you know, like I said, the double doors, things that are definitely forefront on the street. We also try to carry that into the home as much as possible. If there's big um, wood that was there before, we try to rehab that, that same wood and reuse that uh, material. That is also another affordable way is to reuse the materials that are there that are historic. So we make sure that that's at the forefront of our bid specs, um, if at all possible, to kind of um, reuse any of those materials that are there. So you can see those before and afters. Um, this kind of this does create a lot of uh, quality quality housing, and like I said, um, a lot of opportunities for our first time home buyers because we keep it affordable, even though historic preservation is at that forefront. Um, overall, a lot of um, our grants are required to look at the historic preservation of a, uh, anything that we're rehabbing. Um, specifically, federal funds like our Lead and Healthy Homes grant. So every time that we have a Lead and Healthy Homes um, house that goes through our program, it must go through the State Historic Preservation Office for their concurrence with our bid specs. Um, and that because their size and shape of the windows needs to stay the same, um, we can't make openings where they didn't exist before. So those all have to be reviewed and come back. And um, we had 14.4 million um, spent on that program in the last five years. And that's one of the um, you know, forefront that, that housing is at. Um, we also, our other grants are Healthy Homes Production Grant. They're for a little bit less, but those do the exact same thing. Anything that comes down from HUD or our federal grants has to go through that State Historic Preservation Office review. Um, and our planning department supports all of those efforts. So as we look at each individual house, they have to complete an entire site inventory, help us send that on. Um, so a lot of work goes into that from the planning services department to also help with um, the historic review. Um, another thing that we've um, leveraged, so we put monies direct, directly into homes, but we also leverage funds, and the city council approved um, using urban revitalization um, as a tool to help um, incentivize affordable housing. 
But what that also does is leverage private funds from homeowners to rehab their um, spaces. And um, in that, there was $5.3 million that we spent in, to improve 145 homes. Um, and that's, that's over just the um, anyone who's participated since we made the Dubuque um, larger, the larger revitalization area in about 2019. Um, there's also a multi-residential with that. So there was also an additional three and a half in the bigger multi-residential ones. And they are many of our historic buildings. So our big historic uh, multi-residential um, buildings, uh, we threw those in the memo for you so that you can see them. They're just, it's numerous. Um, and every time those are at the forefront of um, in our historic districts and making sure we're putting that investment back in. And what that ultimately does is helps to um, maintain our historic homes. So even if a homeowner does make a choice, because sometimes they do get to make a choice if they're not in historic district, but it is, it's not a um, home that is designated as historic, um, they can make choices that wouldn't keep the historic value of the home. However, we see that they often do because we have incentives and grants that can help them do that. Um, and any type of maintenance, even if sometimes they have to switch out a material, is actually gonna help us keep that historic building in its place. So one that we do see often is that historic buildings can get to be a little much for homeowners to rehab, and um, which is why we have programs to help, but we don't want them to just continue to deteriorate because that's what we then see have to come before city council as individual buildings that just went too far down the uh, no maintenance path and end up having to be demolished. And that's what we're trying to avoid. So uh, we do keep uh, the historic features at the forefront, but we really just wanna also make sure we're maintaining those historic buildings. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Jill Connors to talk about economic development side. <coughs> Jill Connors, economic development director. Alexis talked to you about saving our housing stock through, house, uh, through historic rehabilitation. Now I'm gonna to talk to you mostly about commercial projects. You may or may not recognize this building. Oh, so, but you might re recognize it here. Same building. Uh, in our downtown in the 1000 block of Main Street. Um, it was falling apart and um, one of our local developers brought it back to life and now it includes uh, several dozen uh, low to mod income apartments as well as storefronts that are all filled. So that's great uh, Excuse me, economic development. Alexis made a good point of saying, we come to you with onesie twosie projects to put in front of you, but we thought it was important to show you what does this all mean together? What's the big impact? From the commercial side, uh, these numbers represent investment that the economic development department has put into rehab projects uh, since 2004. There's been about $35 million invested from the city, but that has leveraged over or $275 million in private investment. That's nearly an eight to one um, ratio there. So every dollar that the city is putting in leverages $8 of additional investment from the private sector. That's a pretty good return on our investment, and we're maintaining the, the integrity of our downtown. Our grant programs have helped um, 77 properties across the downtown area since 2004. Some of them are very small, you've never heard of. Some of them are very large. The Roshek Building, the Karad Co, Novelty Ironworks Building, and many others that I'm sure you drive around and, and you look at them and say, wow, that looks great. They probably went through our program. I'm gonna turn it over to Wally to talk about planning um, since their department is a huge piece of what Alexis and I are able to accomplish uh, through 
historic preservation. All right, thanks, thanks Jill. So, um, historic preservation, it's a big deal in the planning department. It's one of our activities, actually. Um, so when we talk about financial incentives, we're not only talking about the money that's invested in the buildings, but the city council's invested in our department. So um, the funding through the city helps pay for a staff member and myself to help cover, to move on the historic preservation activity. Um, we've taken on that role and responsibility since 1999 when it was transferred to the Planning Services Department under the directions of Laura Karstens. And since then, we've been able to grow the program and in order to provide additional incentives. Um, you know, currently with uh, historic preservation in our community, we have uh, several numbers that you see up here um, that we're actively researching and, and designating historic properties, um, identifying local landmarks and local historic districts. We actually have 19 National Register Historic Districts, but how do we arrive at these numbers and where they come from? Well, typically it's funding that's received by this city council, seed money, just a little bit of money, $5,000 here, $10,000 here, there, that we use to leverage what they call certified local development, um, or so-called certified local government grants, um, historic resource development program grants, in order to help do an in-depth historic analysis of our community. And that tells us about our history, not only just the buildings, but who lived here, what types of businesses here uh, have been here, and then also um, where we're going. So I'm very excited. Um, you'll have a work session request actually at the end of this city council meeting for the Black Heritage Survey for us to give a, an update with regards to that. And that's an example of some of the funding that's being provided in our community. But the one thing we always talk about is the greenest building is also the one that's already built. So there's embodied energy that's already put in that building. Um, if there's ability to save it, rehabilitate it, to make it an adapted reuse, uh, and it's, it's a great asset in our community. And a lot of times, when we talk to people about Dubuque, and if they're not from Dubuque, you just ask them, what do you think of Dubuque? They think of Mississippi River. They think of Old River Town. They think of architecture. They think of the Fenelon Place elevator. They think about the shot tower. Those are things in our community that help define and identify who we are and where we're from. And helping us you know, assist with that, with all the financial incentives that have been reinvested in our community. And as Jill's indicated and Alexa's indicated, it's, it's dollars that are invested in a home that allows people to live and stay and be able to work here. It's invested in economic development that helps in turn create jobs and then also um, to help as an as um, asset to not only retain our workforce but also to have individuals come into our community um, for that. So, you know, there is a lengthy document that I continually hand out to you guys so I don't need to go through all our commitment to historic preservation. But you know, we do regulate, we do have architectural guidelines, we have incentives. And then, you know, one of the big things that we get involved with is, you know, partnering. So, um, you know, people planning in partnerships, you know, it, no, Dubuque doesn't do it. And Dubuque does it the best, in my opinion. So, um, you know, we have a commitment to historic preservation. And like I mentioned, be through those regulations and architectural guidelines and incentives and everything. But it's our partnerships that we work with our state and national and local groups. You know, it's the Dubuque Heritage Works, it's the Dubuque Main Streets, it's the State Historic Preservation Office. We have an actually a great working relationship with our State Historic Preservation Office. It's Preservation Iowa, it's the National Trust for Historic Preservation. It's, you know, our local developers and our homeowners that want to reinvest in our community. It's the city departments. And it's from you, it's a guidance from you guys as a whole. Um, Historic preservation came about in the city of Dubuque in the late 1970s, and it started out as demolition districts, urban renewal. We're coming through and we're wiping out swaths of land in our downtown. And some citizens stepped up and said, hey, that's not right. Let's try to preserve a lot of these, of these structures. And from there, developed our conservation districts, our historic districts, and, and as now I can proudly say, you know, we're, we're historic Dubuque, right? People love to come to our community and spend their dollars. But then also it's the pride of being able to live in this community. I've lived here for 20 years. I've had an opportunity to leave a couple times. I just can't. I mean, I love the historic <laughs> architecture. I love the valleys. I love the rivers. We're not identified anywhere else in the state of Iowa. Went to school at Iowa State. They called us flatlanders out in names here. I said, not where I'm from. I mean, there's peaks and valleys and everything like that. So. Um, that's all we have for our presentation. We just kind of wanted to let you know and give you a thanks for a, your commitment to historic preservation. 
and all the incentives that you help provide in, in order to help Dubuque a great, make Dubuque a great place. So thank you. Well, thank you very much, um, Alexis, Joe, and Wally for that presentation. I think, um, you know, more than anything, I, I think it's really important that this is now a, a matter of record that we can point back to and say, this is a good example of all the ways that we have um, maintained our commitment to preservation. I think that's really important that we continue to tell that story. Any, yeah, Mr. Resnick. Uh, just quickly, uh, among the partners that uh, you mentioned, many, one that you, you didn't mention, and I'm sure, it's a great that the city of Dubuque has citizen input because we have our, our historic preservation commission. And um, that's very important that we bring them in and they give us a lot of great information and feedback. And they're, uh, you know, I just wanted to, that we include and support these citizen groups. It's, it's mutually beneficial. And I, I just, I know that wasn't intentional, but they do a lot of great work for us and we really appreciate what they do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. All right, seeing no further discussion, we got a motion by Jones and a second by Resnick to uh, receive and file and watch that presentation. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Action item number four is smart parking mobility update and commuter shuttle update. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. Move to receive and file and hear the presentation. Second by Sprank. Motion by Jones, second by Sprank. Go straight to Ryan here when he's ready. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council members, uh, City Manager Van Milligan, um, City Attorney. Um, I'm here tonight to do two presentations, one on transportation services, the parking division update on the Smart Parking Mobili Mobility Management Plan, um, and then the second one is a new bus route that the Jewel is going to be putting together that we're calling the Community Shuttle. Um, I would like to start with the parking side with the Smart Parking Mobility Management Plan. Um, this was approved. This study has been going on. We've been working with Walter, our Walker Consulting, RDG, and Bolton and Mink as far as our consulting team. Um, so what have we been doing? Um, we've been doing a lot of community engagement, and along with that community engagement, we've been doing a lot of data collection also. Um, as we reach out to the community to try to hear what they want us to do and what their needs are and requirements are, um, we've been working internally with city data, looking at different um, condition assessments of the ramps, the parking lots, looking at occupancy turnover for the ramps and um, the lots. Along with that, we're digging into the financials right now to see what's going to best suit the city as we move forward. Um, the biggest thing we're working on right now is the stakeholder engagement where we have RDG reaching out to businesses and organizations in the downtown area trying to get their input on what they would like to see future state as we move forward. Um, RDG's done a great job of reaching out and connecting with a, a bunch of groups already. Um, they've met with 16 different groups already. They have 16 more on the calendar to meet with. And then there's 20 that they've reached out to vote, both email and phone call to get meetings set up that way. Um, the stakeholder engagement is very important as we move forward because that engagement is going to allow us to figure out um, what's the voice and then we're going to look at the financials and not only the financials but the infrastructure that we have that's in our parking ramps as we move forward. So as RDG goes through and meets with a lot of these stakeholders, um, they're really pushing our, our survey that we have out on the web. Um, on the Dubuque City website we have the Move Dubuque website and the link for it along with the QR code. Um, we're really pushing people to get out there and voice their opinion on the downtown parking area. So definitely tonight, it's up on the board. Quick QR code, you can go right to that. Not only is the smart parking uh, survey on there, but the historic millwork survey is on there also. It takes five to eight minutes to take the survey, and then that way we get the input on it. Currently, we have about 400 surveys taken for the smart parking side of it which we're happy, we'd like to really boost that up to get that somewhere around the 1,000 mark before we close it. Um, right now we have a soft close around December 30th. That way we can start collaborating, putting data together. 
um, but we'll have a hard close around January 6th to get that survey so we can get this data put together to start using it. Um, as that data is being collected through the survey side, uh, my team at the, on the parking division has been collecting our own data internally on occupancy levels in our parking ramps. So in our parking ramps, we have gone weekly starting in September. Um, we started in September, sat down for October a little bit, and then November we've done consistent parking uh, ramp collection. Um, with that, we're looking at occupancy le levels. So how many cars are physically in the ramps in a day? Not how many spots are, are, are rented or, or um, taken, but we want to know how many people are actually using those ramps every day. And with this, you're going to notice that on a given day, our daily um, occupancy level is around 33%. Um, if, you, if you include the Port of Dubuque ramp, we're down to 28%. So a lot of our ramps, we have plenty of room in right now because um, we're only about a third full across the board. Even our busier ramps, which would be the Locust Street and Iowa Street ramps, they're ranged around that 50% full rate on a given day. We've also been doing this with our parking, our surface lots. Um, we do have some surface lots that get a lot of activity, which is fantastic. That's what we want to see. Um, but as we've gone through this, they really average about 21 to 23% full on a daily um, count. We're doing these counts anywhere from Tuesday to Thursday during the week, so we're hitting the heart of the week. Um, and that would be when more of the workforce would be present. Bolton and Mink is another consultant that we're working with. In September, they were able to go through on the 15th and the 17th, and they did different time studies. So they started at 10 in the morning, then they came back later in the afternoon and early evening. Um, and then clearly you can see by the charts that, that are shown that we do have a large workforce that comes in during the day, but as the day progresses on, most of our ramps empty out down to the 10 to 15% mark. Um, the one ramp that does, there are two ramps that do fill up. One would be the intermodal ramp because we have a lot of residents that use that ramp as we go forward. Um, and then the other ramp would be the Port of Dubuque. But we had Bolton and Mink do this. They did a quick study on it over this, this week that they were in Dubuque. Um, and they were kind of shocked with how low those numbers were. Um, I did exclude the Port of Dubuque ramp because that ramp's built more for an entertainment side. Um, and when Bolton and Mink were there at 10 a.m. they noticed 13 percent, but on Thursday at that time at 6 p.m. you see it gradually increases on its way up um, with more than nightlife. Same thing we saw on the Saturday that they ran the study for there also. So with Bolton and Mink doing that study, they also looked at not only the surface lots, um, the off-street parking ramps, but they looked at on-street parking also. Um, and on the 15th of September they noticed they, they were, did the study and with that, they came up with that about 31% of our on-street parking was full. So within the city of Dubuque, we were averaging right around that 30% full within the ramps, the lots, and our on-street. So one thing we're looking at now as we collect this data, RDG is collecting the stakeholder data as we move forward. What we want to move into is what technology is going to work for us. As we move forward, we have different ramps, different infrastructure in the ramps, so we're looking at technologies that would be able to fit in these ramps. Um, today we had a call with Walker Consulting, and they went through different technologies that they've seen out in the market. They're strictly a consulting company. They're not pushing any certain type of vendor our way. They're just letting us know different ways and in, in different technologies out there. Um, as we move forward, we're going to collect the data from the surveys. Um, we're definitely going to be looking at the revenue and expenses that we see in our lots and our ramps, um, and then long-term maintenance of our ramps as we move forward. Um, but my, my big part on this is the data-driven operations. We want to make sure that we're collecting enough data to give us uh, long-term what we want to do. Um, not only the data from the public input, but the data from the, the financial numbers and our ramp um, costs over the year. Some of the technologies that we're looking at, um, we're definitely looking at license plate readers as a, pos as a possibility. Um, definitely kiosk systems as we move forward. But you'll see on the slide that I'm showing right now, there's a ton of technology out there. Um, in the bottom left corner of the slide are kiosk systems that were in a pilot program in Dubuque before. So Dubuque's seen some of this technology. Um, Russ Deckline and I have been traveling around and, and actually physically using this technology. Um, 
we're, we're really excited with where we can go with this. Um, we have a lot of stuff in, in our current model. We have three to four different technologies that we use. We're, ha we're hoping to get this down to one system. Um, along with that, if we're able to update our technology, the convenience of the, the public will be a lot easier. Um, I do want to point out, in the middle of the top row, there is a cell phone app. I don't know if you guys have ever used the apps as you travel to different cities, but I've done it in two different cities, and literally, it can tell you where to park. You just pick on the area, it says we're going to park here, and it shows you how to get there. Um, I'm not saying that's technology that we will be incorporating right away, but it's definitely something that we want to look at long term as, as we go into this change. So the big thing as we look at the technology is what type of outcomes do we want from this? Um, the biggest thing that we're looking for on the parking side is we're looking to big, build recommendations and a work plan for the council to look at. Um, and with that, technology is going to play a very large role along with um, the city IT's infrastructure on what we can and can't do. Um, and then with that, when we come to you guys, we want to make sure we have our implementation action plan. And in that plan, we want to make sure that we have our cost estimates, our technology, and what kind of conclusion we've come to with this, with this project. The other section of this plan that we're working on right now is the mobility side. Because once you park your car, you still have to get from A to B. So we're trying to figure out how do we improve safety, how do we improve the comfort, convenience, and connectedness throughout the city. These are themes that, are de are, are, that we're collecting as we meet with the stakeholders. So some of the groups are mentioning different safety things that they want us to look at. Um, we're definitely taking these down when we're building um, pretty much a, a note board of, okay, these are things that we need to look at now and then future state as we move forward. So where are we going to go? Right now, we're definitely still in the data collection phase. We're definitely working with different stakeholder groups. We're working internally with the city. And then we're working with different um, research with technology that will be able to be supported by our city. Um, the next stage, the next time I hope to meet with your group, um, I'm hoping to have some recommendations and a path forward on what we're going to do with this. And that path forward is going to have possible implementation plan as we move forward, uh, maybe some specific technology that we think might look good in our ramps and would actually physically work with our ramps, and then different cost methods on how we want to do the revenue as we move forward with this plan. Um, and I'm hoping that we have that filled out sometime in mid-January to end of January to sit down with you guys. And with that, I will take any questions on the smart parking system. Did you want to do questions now? You said you had to Yeah, let's, we can talk through the questions now. That okay. way you don't Just have to. While we're talking about this They're not one, burning a hole in your pocket okay. that way. All right. Do we have any questions? Mr. Resnick. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And um, a couple questions. First of all, how are we reaching out to our older residents specifically? I want them to be part of this. Uh, um, I mean, I think they're going to be uh, making the, the biggest adjustment, perhaps, uh, if they're not going to be able to put coins in, and maybe they will be. You're still looking at that. But our, how are we specifically reaching out to our older citizens? So we have a very large list of stakeholders that we're reaching out to, and in that, it includes some of our residence areas. And I'm, I mean, these groups range from churches to residence areas. Um, and then along with that, we're definitely trying to get them to take the surveys throughout the throughout the city. Okay, thank you. And I, you talked about uh, looking at actual use um, and 50% full, um, but they're not 50% available, right? Correct. Because right now, so many are spoken for, they're paid for. Correct. And if people uh, park there, there's fines and there's towing, mm -hmm. right? So um, are we looking at availability? I know this is all what the smart parking study is going to address, right? Correct. We're looking at availability of these spaces. Um, no changes have been set in place. No changes have been made. Um, but we're definitely looking at different ways we're going to utilize our ramps at the current time. Um, occupancy levels are, are showing that we're usually about 30% full in our ramps. But you're 100% right, Mr. Resnick. Some of our ramps, especially Locust and Iowa Street, are sold out ramps um, that permit holders have those spots. And finally, uh, in the mobility section, you talked about rolling. What, what, what is rolling? Possible rollerblades, um, skateboards, um, different ways to move around with that type of technology. The way I, I go. That's, well, I, I, don't, I, I, call. I stay off that stuff. It's too dangerous for me. It's pretty dangerous. I was, I was just wondering if you had those little e, 
E things that are uh, cluttering up so many cities that you kind of rent and you um, go from place to place and hop on board. What, what are the names of those? Um, the electric scooters? Yeah, those little scooter things. So they, they've come up in discussions in different worlds, uh, different ways, and actually I was able to see those when I traveled to Omaha. Um, they had uh, electric scooters throughout their city, and I was able to get some feedback on that from that location. Great. I'm looking forward to this, too. Thank you for your, all your great work. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Sure. Quick trivia. Um, whenever those scooters are available in any city, I ride them every single time. I can't get enough of those scooters, so that's just a quick, quick piece of trivia. All right. Mr. Sprank. Uh, Ryan, have we talked, so we, we found out we don't have very good occupancy, but we've got these lovely ramps rented out. Have we ever talked about on reserving them and getting it over with? Just on reserve the ramps so then, yeah, you can park anywhere if you're paying for parking? So that conversation's come up. Okay. At the current time, we're working with our consulting teams to advise us on what they feel would be the best recommendations for the city. Um, and as we put those recommendations, they'll come before council to, to be discussed. Any others? All right. Fantastic. The next one? Mr. Mayor? Oh, sorry, Ms. Farber. Yes, go ahead. Yes, I just have one uh, question for Ryan. Um, based upon um, the uh, study that's going on for mobility, uh, any chance that you're looking at the e-vehicle charging station and where those could be implemented? I know we've talked about this before, but is this part of the study? Um, that is a discussion we're going to have. Uh, implementation of e-chargers is not part of the study, but that is a topic we're discussing because some of our ramps do have chargers in them, and we're discussing um, different m uh, ways to charge for that location along with the charging of the, the charger stations. So that is a topic that we are addressing. Um, actual chargers being put throughout the city is not part of this study, but that mm -hmm. is a theme that we're going to look at for, for future state. All right. Well, thank you, because I think it's, it's a revenue um, opportunity as well. So thank you. Hey, Chargers. Exit. Give me one second, mm -hmm. and I'll switch over to um, downtown corridors presentation. I'm looking. I was going to say, Ryan, I thought that there was only one PowerPoint for your presentation, so I think there was only one uploaded to this. Okay, well, there, that's just fine. I can talk through the no, second section. No, it's on there. Yeah, it's, it's on the agenda. It's just not on the, the pre yes. presenter's laptop. Is there any way I yes. can pull that up? Um, if not, I can just talk through this one. That's perfectly fine. Yeah, I'm sorry. I know that it has been uploaded to the agenda item, so they do have access to it. I apologize for the inconvenience. Not a problem at all. Okay, so I'm going to um, descriptively talk through the second section that we were looking at. Yeah, if you want to look at it real quick, Randy. Randy Gale to the rescue. And, well, he's the, I'm sorry. He's the first guy I want to talk to you about, though. Um, so we had a lot of outreach from the RDG, um, some local businesses in town. Uh, about possible um, early route shuttles. Um, and when I came to the city, um, I had some goals set in mind on, on which way we were going to work. Um, the first thing I definitely wanted to do was get more students on our bus. And we've increased that by three times. So definitely got more students riding our buses right now. And now we're looking at how do we get m more employees to employers. So we had some outreach from some companies. The uh, GDDC, um, I can't thank Rick Dickinson enough for some of the outreach that he's done and, and some, some of the funding that they're working with the Jewel on. Um, but I also want to give Randy Gale's team a big kudos on this also. They've done a fantastic job of putting out our, our handouts for this. Um, Trevor did a fantastic job to get his name dropped in there. Um, so what we've done is we're building a Dubuque commuter shuttle route. Um, this is a very early morning shuttle route that's going to start about 445 in the morning. Um, we're going to run two buses throughout the city and one on the east side of town, one on the west side of town. Um, and with this shuttle service, um, it's going to allow um, potential employees to get to employers by a 6 a.m. start times. Um, with working with the RDG, we were able to calculate a lot of the start times on the east side of town and west side of town. And with that, um, we're able to build routes that are going to allow us to get there. Is this sharing, Randy? 
We've got it in front of us. Yeah, we can mm -hmm. see it. Okay, Sorry. fantastic. Yep. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, with that, like I said, we're going to have these buses start about right at 4.45 in the morning. One bus is going to do um, the east side of town. That's going to be the, the AM East 1. And with that, um, that bus is going to run through certain neighborhoods that we feel that we have great ridership currently, that this could potentially pick up more ridership to help people get to and from employment. Um, so this bus will run on the east side of town, and it's going to end at the Midtown, or the Jewel Midtown Transfer Facility. Um, some people call it the Dell High Facility up by Finley Hospital. Um, and it'll get there about 520 in the morning. We'll have another shuttle bus running on the west side of town. That's also going to start at 445 in the morning from the Jewel Midtown, run a big circle around the west side of town, and end back at the Jewel Midtown transfer at 520 in the morning. These buses are going to meet up so that if somebody's on the east side of town and needs to get the west side, we can transfer buses at this time and vice versa. Somebody on the west side that needs to get the east side of town. After these buses meet up and the riders are able to transfer to and from the buses that they need, um, the AM East number two bus is going to travel past Loris College down to Kerper Boulevard and through Kerper Boulevard and the, the industries that are down there. And it will end up at Hodge and John Deere at the end of that route. Um, you'll notice that this, these buses will start at 520 from the Midtown and they will end at John Deere at 544 in the morning, which is, gives um, riders plenty of time to get off the bus through the facility into their workstations. Um, that is same for the AM West route, number two bus. It's going to leave the, the Midtown Transfer Center at 520 in the morning and it will go through some more residential area and then it'll make its way out towards the industrial west side on Chavanel Road. Um, some of the larger companies will go by, it'll go right high, AY McDonald, um, all the way out to Simmons on the far side. Again, another route that's going to get employees to employers by 6 a.m. in the morning for start times. As, as they get to work, we're, we, we want to make sure we can get them picked up because some of these locations are, are off our normal fixed routes. So with that, we did put it, we are going to implement a PM route to go pick up all of these locations. So again, we're going to have a PM East route that is going to physically start at Hodge and John Deere, work its th way down through the downtown, and then end at the intermodal transfer facility so riders can transfer buses to get to their home locations. The reason that bus does not go back down Kerper Boulevard is because we have other buses fixed routes that actually physically run that route already. So any riders from those industries that we dropped off earlier already have an option to get back on a jewel bus to get back to the facility. Um, and then we will also have the PM West route. This will start out um, on the west side again, go through all of the places we drop people off in the morning, and it will end at the Jewel JFK transfer location for riders to switch routes to transfer buses to get home at night um, or where they need to go. A big thing with this route um, and this service that we, we're putting together is it's going to be a six-month trial period. Um, we're putting this in as a pilot program. Um, that way we can work with the FTA and we've worked with the ECIA on this program. Um, we're going to put it in as a six-month trial program. Um, ridership's going to be free for this. We're making it free for all to ride this bus. Even on the routes home, we're going to make it so they just get a transfer ticket um, to get home to make sure that um, they're utilizing this service. One thing that transportation's heard is a lot of employees said that, you know, a reason people aren't getting to work is they have no transportation. Um, this early route Yes, a rider that gets on at the intermodal on the east route may have to ride the bus for 45 to 50 minutes, but it's still an opportunity for them to get from point A to point B to a, 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 pl a place of work. Um, so this route is going to be set up fare free to, for the first six months um, that we run this program. And then as we hear feedback from the different industries, we're definitely looking at um, modifying as needed. Um, I was very fortunate, Jody Johnson and I were able to attend the GDDC hiring event that they did last, last week. Um, we had tons of input. Uh, we had some very happy HR teams that um, were not begging for, but they were asking for, can we get your documentation? Can we get your maps? Um, so we've been emailing out information to different um, companies this week. Um, I know they're promoting it with their, their new uh, possible employees. Um, so that way they can get people to their facilities to fill their shifts. And that's all I have that. I'm here to take some questions. Well, that's excellent. I'm very excited to hear about that news. So thank you very much. Yes, Ms. Wethel. 
Just a question on toward the end of the six months, how are you going to get feedback from ridership? So the six months will be based on ridership numbers, of course, but we're also going to be reaching out to a lot of businesses that we, we noticed we had ridership to. Um, at the end of six months, we're going to evaluate how many riders we received, and, and we're, we're helping out and supporting. And then from there, we'll be able to look at um, potential funding as we move forward. The infrastructure bill was a great help to the Jewel. We did not receive extra funding um, for this year. Um, and we'll look at applying that funding to move forward after the six months if we feel that ridership is still um, pretty valid to move forward with. I guess my question might better be said as, if I get on the bus and something isn't serving me well with the route, how can I communicate that at the end of six months? Oh, I don't wait six months. No, but I mean, <laughs> you know what I mean? Are you um, gonna do an active survey? Definitely um, talk to me right away. Uh, our best survey that we've done with this is we physically reached out to companies, and John Deere was one of those companies that they physically did a survey through their shifts and said, hey, would you use this service? How would you use this service? Um, we actually did another test pilot run with Hodge and John Deere today to do the whole route with them, and we were receiving feedback the entire time. So it was a very, it was a very good experience today. Um, but as this progresses and goes, we'll be able to look where the riders are getting on and getting off, um, and we'll be able to work with companies on what's working well, what's not working well. Thank you. This is not a set in stone route. We're, we're able to fluctuate a little bit to make sure that we can um, help people as needed. Mr. Resnick. Thank you. And uh, this won't happen in the next six months, but are there, there are talks about perhaps including there, uh, you know, there's a, could be a child care facility out in the industrial center west. How about, will, can they pick up their kids? Can they bring their kids on this bus? So this bus is a very good question. Um, and I did not stress it as I went through my notes. Uh, this about bus is for anyone to use. So if somebody wants to get on this bus at 4.50 in the morning and ride it um, to any bus stop in, that's on these routes, they're more than willing to do that. This is not just set for employees. This is um, the jewel serves all. So if anyone wants to hop on this bus, they can easily utilize the service. Okay. So yes, if anyone wants to use this bus to get to anywhere in town, they can easily do that. The daycare side of this um, is being discussed right now. What we're trying to make sure is that there'd be enough time in the routes if we did set up that with daycares. Um, so that is being evaluated right now. I see. Thank you very much. All right. All right. Other comments then? Thank you, Ryan, very much. This is incredibly helpful information. Thank you very much. All right. We've got four action items down, 12 to go. We're getting a good practice run for our budget hearings coming up in March here, you know, nothing like a little pre-Christmas present, so let's keep rocking and rolling. We've got a motion by Jones, second by Sprank. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Action item number five is local housing trust fund grant award acceptance. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second. Motion by Roussel, second by Jones. Crown, please. Housing and Community Development Director Alexis Steger is recommending City Council approve the resolution and accept the Local Housing Trust Fund Grant Award of $229,974 for fiscal year 23 and authorize the City Manager or his designee to execute documents to ensure proper spending and regulations are met for support of home ownership and rehabilitation activities in the Washington neighborhood. The city manager concurs with the recommendation and respectfully requests mayor and city council approval. All right, any discussion? Uh, Mr. Mayor? Yes, Mr. Uh, does anybody know how this compares with last year's or uh, historically? Is this uh, about uh, what we've gotten before? Or? You know, I bet Alexis would know that. Yeah. Housing and Community Development Director Alexis Seger. Um, actually, this year is an increase. So um, with all of the ARPA funds and everything that happened, the National Housing Trust Fund was increased at the state level for everybody that um, receives this funding. So last year received about 185000 and this year we're over the $200,000 mark. Super. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You bet. Thank you, Alexis. All right. 
Seeing no further discussion, we've got a motion by Roussel and a second by Jones. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. All right. I hear Ms. Wethel coming back. Ms. Wethel, we, we did the roll. Aye. Thank you very much. We got a motion passes 7 0. Action item number six is solar renewable energy credit agreements. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Sprank. I motion that we receive and file. Second. Motion by Sprank, second by Jones. Grana, please. There is not a memo on this item. It is just uh, receive and file and there for your information to let you know that the um, agreements have been entered into. Thank you very much for the information. Do we have any discussion or questions? Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Sprank. Um, I just want to say that um, I really like this program. I mean, this is a way for our to help our neighbors gain energy independence and save money overall. And hopefully we can expand this program to find ways to encourage more families to participate in this program. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sprank. All right, motion by Sprank and a second by Jones to receive and file. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick. Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number seven is Code of Ordinance Amendments on Appointment to the Board of Library Trustees and Civil Service Commission. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move to receive and file the communications and further move that the requirement that a proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage of two council meetings prior to the meeting at which is to be finally passed to be suspended. Second by Wethel. Motion by Jones and a second by Wethel. Crana, please. Adrian's going to take this one. Mm -hmm. Adrian, please. Adrian Breitfelder, City Clerk. Two ordinance amendments are proposed to remove the procedure of council concurrence for appointments to the Board of Library Trustees and the Civil Service Commission. Removing this language will result in appointments to both commissions occurring by a vote of the City Council. Both the Board of Library Trustees and the Civil Service Commission are established by state code, and this update will lead to consistency with state code regarding the appointment procedure. I respectfully recommend City Council approval of two ordinances amending the appointment procedure for the Board of Library Trustees and Civil Service Commission. Thank you, Adrian. We'll take you off the hook. That's right. Yeah, and I, and I do want to thank you, actually, for, um, for your work on this. I, I think this is really important, both of you, for um, being able to change this. I, I do think that it cleans things up, makes the process much more in line with the way we do other commission work. So I think it's going to be a very good change. So thank you. Any other discussion? Just to say, if anybody's watching and wondering what, what we're talking about, current practice for those two is it's a mayor's appointment with council concurrence. The change is that it will be appointed like everybody else with, uh, with the council's appointment. Yeah. And it kind of takes the mayor off the hook for for some pretty important appointments <laughs> yeah. in case something would ever go wrong. And I think it just makes the process cleaner. But yeah. I actually do That's want to I mean. provide a point of clarification for that. Um, I know at least with the Civil Service Commission, it will still be an appoint a selection by the mayor with vote by the council simply because state code specifies that how it has to occur. Perfect. Mm -hmm. All right. So more of a procedural matter, but very helpful for us sitting up here. So we got a motion by Jones, second by Wethel, waive the three readings and receive and file. So Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. I move final consideration and passage of the ordinances. Second. Got a motion by Jones and a second by Wethel. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Action item number eight is Upper B Branch Creek Restoration Railroad Sanitary Interceptor Crossing Project. Mr. Mayor. Um, Mr. Sprank. Oh. I motion that we receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second. Motion by Sprank and a second by Resnick. Mm -hmm. Brenna. City Engineer Gus Sahoyas is recommending City Council adopt a resolution awarding the contract for the Upper B Branch Creek Restoration Railroad Sanitary Interceptor Crossing Project, part of Phase 4 of the B Branch Watershed Flood Mitigation Project, to Engineering and Construction Innovations Incorporated in the low bid amount of $3,265,620. The city manager concurs with the recommendation and respectfully requests mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Krenna. Any discussion? 
I'll just say real quickly, people still ask every once in a while, you're still working on the B branch? And the answer is yes, we are. It's a massive project and it's really important. And I'm glad to see that we're still moving forward. Um, the bids are, uh, you know, they're challenging right now. So things are coming in a little bit higher, but this is a very important project and I think a good one to move forward with. All right. So we have a motion by Sprank and a second by Resnick to receive and file and adopt that resolution. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number nine is temporary staff wage increase recommendations, leisure services. Mr. Mayor? Ms. Roussel? I move to receive and file. Second by Wethel? We got a motion by Roussel and a second by Wethel. Krenna, please. Leisure Services Manager Marie Ware recommended to the city manager and the city manager approved wage increases for temporary staff positions within the Leisure Services Department that have not been adjusted. Leisure Services has seen a steady climb to return to normal registration numbers for programs in 2022, greatly increased by over 2,000 participants compared to 2021. As programs and services continue to bounce back from the pandemic, the recruitment and hiring of staff is a high priority. The shortage in staff for 2022 resulted in the altered operation of city pools, the marina, parks, and several programs. It increased the workload for all staff full-time through temporary employees so that the community wouldn't see an even greater reduction in services. Staff has created a recruitment plan for the 2023 summer season. As part of this process, it is critical to have competitive wages established and in place as part of the recruitment. Over the last two seasons, wage increases were approved, but well after the recruitment process had begun and only for specific positions. These increases did positively impact the late recruitment of staff, but would have had a greater impact if implemented in the beginning of recruitment, which is set for now through April. The city manager respectfully requests mayor and city council receive and file this information. Thank you, Grena. Any discussion? Well, Mr. Mayor? Yes, Mr. Resnick. Uh, these are temporary uh, workers, not temporary raises, correct? Yes. Okay, because I, I looked at that, uh, and so are we, uh, is there a difference between the folks, what, I guess, what is temporary? Is that under 20 hours, or what do they mean by that? I, Marie can chime in on this, but I believe it would be the people that tend to be what we um, historically have called seasonal employees or workers, meaning they come on to say lifeguard for the season at the pool or work a summer park program. Okay. Thank you. Um, Marie Ware, Leisure Services Manager. Uh, she is correct. Um, we've called them seasonals because that's a term a lot of people understand. We'll hire them for the summer or like with our parks employees, we'll hire them in April to go to October because that's kind of the season that we need them. But truly, the right term to call them is temporary employees because they come on temporarily and then they leave. So in other words, we onboard them as city employees at the end of their agreement with us, whether that's two months or a class that lasts X time. So it's a, it's a limited term. It's, it's very much there's a start and an end because it's related to a, a program or an operational need. Um, versus some of our others that work year-round. If they work year-round, but only limited hours, they're called part-time. I see. Great. So temporary, part-time, full-time. Yep. All right. So c city council, we're, we are temporary? You know, I don't know what you're called. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that very much. Thank you very much. You're Thank welcome. You. Awfully you, loaded Mayor. question there, it Mr. Was. Resnick. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, um, Marie, I don't need you to come back up. You can keep on walking back. It's fine. But um, thank you. I just want to commend you for, for making this change along with the city manager. I think it's an important one. I know this is coming up as a part of the discussion we're going to have on budgets in March for the next fiscal year. But this is really important and required. And thank you very much for making this change. Well, the motion is to receive and file um, by Roussel, second by Wethel. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Action item number 10 is Fire Department Reorganization Memorandum of Understanding. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. Move to receive and file and approve the changes. Second. Motion by Jones and a second by Roussel. Crenna, please. 
Fire Chief Amy Scheller is recommending approval of a Memorandum of Understanding with the Dubuque Association of Professional Firefighters, Local 353, and an organizational structure realignment related to city ambulance services. Discussions with the labor group to attrition, the promotion rank on the department's ambulances were held, and an agreement was reached on a general Memorandum of Understanding, which will lead to amendment of the collective bargaining agreement. The discussions outlined an attrition concept which would realign the department's staffing to firefighter paramedics staffing the ambulances and suppression vehicles and falling under the supervision of a fire station suppress suppression vehicle company officer. The station officer would have responsibilities for both fire and EMS supervision and members on both EMS and suppression vehicles would continue to work together on EMS and fire response incidents. It was recognized the attrition of medical officer ranks would reduce the number of promoted ranks and opportunities for promotion. However, it would also serve to realign the span of control and continue to embed fire and EMS service across all Dubuque fire response vehicles. A 3.5% raise was agreed in the MOU agreement. This MOU was voted and agreed upon by the labor group on Friday, December 16th, in exchange for the attrition and realignment of the promoted ranks within the department. 3.5% represents an impact of $181,451 in immediate raises. Promotions for the third ambulance equal $57,977, which would not occur if an agreement were reached. This would begin the attrition process. The attached graph represents the data associated with a 3.5% scenario over a five-year period. The attrition scenario could take longer or shorter to accomplish. The department has been operating below approved FTE staffing since July 1, 2022, which represent a salary and benefit savings of approximately $30,000 each month for four positions. These vacant positions are scheduled to be filled on January 30th, 2023. The vacancy factor for seven months equals approximately $210,000. The city manager concurs with the recommendation and respectfully requests <clears throat> mayor and city council approval. Thank you, Krenna. Any discussion or questions? I, I think I do actually have a question. Uh, Chief, this, this question is actually going to be for you. Um, uh, and thank you very much for sticking around with us tonight to, to be here to talk about this. So I, I think I get what's going on here, but I'm, I, to be completely honest, the first time and the second time that I read through these memos, I was just a little bit confused. So I just want to make sure from the, for the standard of the or for the, for the sake of the public and anybody who's um, going to be paying attention to this, you know, what exactly does this mean, um, you know, for day-to-day -day operations in a way that, uh, you know, is going to matter to the, the residents of the city of Dubuque? I think the biggest question on my mind is, are we still just as safe as we were before? I mean, do we have, you know, do we have the staffing that, that was there to be able to make sure we're covering things so that we know if we call you at the fire department, we're going we're gonna to get an answer, right? Um, but then also, you know, how does this operationalize things in a way that's going to be more efficient and effective for you as a department? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council, Amy Scheller, Fire Chief. Uh, one of the things uh, that I'd like to make point is, first, six months has gone by really fast. Um, and I was able to identify a couple gaps immediately. So having an outside perspective, I noticed that our span of control was um, pretty close to one supervisor for every employee. So almost a one to one, one to two. Ideally, you should be at three to seven, five being the, you know, right in the, in the middle there as prime. Uh, the operations uh, division has 28 firefighter paramedics, 24 fire equipment operators, nine medical officers, 19 fire lieutenants, 10 captains, and three assistant fire chiefs. It's a lot of supervision. And uh, in the evolution of the fire service, it was important to bring uh, substance to the EMS as we evolved and as we brought it in. Um, but it also can drive a line between EMS and fire. So Dubuque Fire Department provides EMS service on our fire engines, and it provides service on our ambulances. It's a force multiplier. A lot of times the community doesn't realize that if a fire engine or a ladder truck shows up at your house and it's an EMS incident, they're able to assist you immediately. Um, so allowing for us to have our company officers at the fire station supervise both fire and EMS uh, and involve some crew integrity uh, is real critical. So there'll be no change in the service provided. It's simply an adjustment to the supervisor level. That makes sense. It does. That's very helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that information. 
Mr. Mayor. Mr. Jones. Yeah, I'll, I'll add that uh, historically, we put all these positions in because years and years ago, there was quite a rift between EMS and fire. The EMS guys weren't allowed to have a regular locker because they're just on the ambulance. And some of the supervisors in the intermediate positions were not helpful to EMS. So they, to fix that, some rank was created to equalize the EMS providers to the fire commanders. So I can tell you that's long over, and Amy is one of the reasons that it's going to be permanently over. Um, this is the right supervision model for the modern fire service. It, it undoes what we worked hard to do, but the conditions that cause us to work hard to do it no longer exist. And we've got responsible people with EMS backgrounds and expectations and, and experience in those uh, supervisory positions now. Um, it did make the department unnecessarily top heavy and, and as one of the guys that really beaten the table to get this done, I'm happy to help undo it. I think that's all very helpful information, so thank you both. All right. All right, then, we have a motion by Jones and a second by Roussel to receive and file and approve that change. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number 11 is coordinated entry and community solutions of Eastern Iowa Street Outreach. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file and view the presentation. Second by Sprank. Got a motion by Roussel and a second by Sprank. I'm going straight to Alexis on this one. Good evening, Alexis Seiger, Housing and Community Development Director. Um, I am going to try to pull back up the website. So um, tonight we're gonna to talk a little bit about the unhoused, um, also known as our homeless population in Dubuque. Um, the one thing I wanted to share tonight, and I may or may not be able to get it back up on the screen, but the um, HUD just came out with a um, nationwide look at unhoused and what happened between 2019 and 2022. The reason this is important is because during COVID, um, shelters had to downsize. And then they got funding to try to re-upsize re and make it safe during COVID. So there was more distance. There was, um, you know, different, t different ways of putting people into beds to make sure you weren't kind of breathing right on each other. Um, and so there was kind of a crisis between 19 and 22 in our homeless population. Um, and HUD just released all their point in time counts. And what was really significant about it, um, there wasn't a, a large increase in the number of homeless between 19 and, and 2022. Um, there was a large increase in um, those that were sheltered between 2021 and 2022. Um, ARPA funds, many other funds actually went towards building more shelter beds throughout the nation. And so more people were able to be sheltered as opposed to unsheltered homeless. So there was a very large change in 2021 to 2022 of those that were able to be sheltered. Um, but what we saw in Iowa, and the, and the report shows this, is that in, in 2015, 2016, 2017, um, we had about 3,000 homeless, and we you know average about 3,000 homeless in the state of Iowa. Um, and then by the time we got to 2019, we were down to one of our lowest numbers of homeless um, in the state of Iowa, and we we're down to about 2,300 homeless. So we were doing a really good job in Iowa of getting getting people um, off of not just streets but out of shelters and into permanent solutions for homes. Um, and then 20. Um, 20 hit, and we actually didn't see that big of an increase, uh, 2,400. And then we went into uh, 2021, and we, 2,500. So a little up, and that's not a good thing, but out of the entire state, we're only going up by 100 over a, a big um, epidemic. Again, shelters did not help. They had less people sheltered, so we have the same amount of homeless, but we had less people we could shelter. Now we've grown again, we have enough shelters, and um, and we have 2,400 homeless in the state of Iowa for 2022. So our numbers have not gone back up to when we were talking about um, before, but we are seeing more people contact the city of Dubuque and say, this is a big problem. What's happening? Why is our homeless population growing? Um, there are some indicators in the HUD report that may point to some of the issues that we're actually seeing, and it's not so much the number of the unhoused. It is much more the chronically unhoused. 
So there was a 30% increase of the chronically unhoused, meaning they, they continually, even if helped or gone through permanent supportive program, end up either back on the streets or they have chosen that that's where they want to live and so they're just going to be unhoused. And so what we're seeing is an increase of those that either have chosen it or are going in and out and we're just seeing them back and seeing them back and seeing them back. Um, and we're getting more citizen calls about that. And how do we help those people? I don't have a lot of solutions. We are looking at options. We've talked about secondary responder model, and we haven't brought that back to city council quite yet because we, we wanted to make sure it was fully formed. What are the outcomes we're trying to do? We're trying to meet with that secondary responder. What, what do we feel like the community needs? We pulled the data around the things that we thought we need to track our outcomes, and now we're trying to decide what kind of model that looks like and, how, and how, what that looks like to present in a budget form. So secondary responder model is going to help with some of that street outreach, um, common knowledge of who is out um, and unhoused on the street, um, more familiarity, uh, resources that have been provided and maybe didn't work, and then uh, back, on, back on the street. Um, so we're, we're looking at how that can help. What we do have already is the Community Solutions um, of Eastern Iowa, uh, CSEI, and they do provide street outreach, um, rapid rehousing, and they are the ones that when you call the ho homeless hotline, that's who you're calling. Uh, what they do is put everybody into a ranking system on priority of those that need to be served for, um, for housing, and they also do some other services. And um, th the partners that provide housing, including the city of Dubuque Housing Department, all get together once a week and make sure that we're pulling off that list by priority. Whoever we can help, whoever's on that list that we're available to help, we help. So we have HACAP and we have all those partners put together, Catholic Charities, and, and that's the list that we wanna pull off of. During COVID, it got a little fractured. The homeless hotline became a, a hotline for every resource. Um, it kinda got overwhelmed. And so people started to try to ask specifically to the partners, can I get your help instead of going to the line and getting prioritized based on how dire my situation is. Um, and so what we're doing right now as a community is bringing that back together, making sure that that coordinated um, hotline, the coordinated entry point is staffed um, and CSEI has asked for help. The city of Dubuque did help with some funding um, for a temporary position, but they need more help. So we do need to look at what those are going to be, and I know they're gonna do that through the budget process. So that's something that they'll bring to the city council through the budget process as a partner. And, um, but until then, we are supporting anything that they need. One thing that they asked for was supplies. It is hard to get supplies, so citizens are concerned. Um, you know, sleeping bags and, and warm clothing, warm outerwear are all things that they will go and give out onto when they do street outreach. For those that say, I don't wanna be sheltered. I like being where I am, I'm okay, they make sure they have the warmth, the food, et cetera. So um, those can be donated directly to CSEI and it's something that citizens can do immediately. Um, and I would encourage residents that are concerned to do that. Um, as far as resources in their shelters, we do keep track of um, how they're doing on capacity. CSEI does that on the forefront. Um, if we hear about concerns from the City of Dubuque Housing Department, we'll, we'll also reach out. Um, prior to this, I reached out and did get a response from our Teresa shelter that they had three beds available, but that was unusual. The last couple of weeks, it's been one in, one out, and at capacity. So we are seeing some shelter capacity issues. When that happens, other partners will step up with um, hotel nights or other ways to get people off um, uh, when it's really cold. So we do have some resources and things out there, and because we come together every week, those partners are making sure we don't have people that are unhoused on, um, that are at the, in danger. Um, one other thing that Mary Rose Corrigan, our health department um, director, was telling me today was just remember, we also always go out when it's cold. So right now it's very cold and we knew it was coming. Um, it's something that we do outreach and we do have our police department intentionally looking for people who might be out in the cold that have always told us, no, I don't wanna be sheltered because that can change when you are really, really cold. And so we always make sure we find them, we talk to them, and make sure they're still okay being unhoused and unsheltered. Um, and we do make those contacts even with some of those that are much harder to make contact with. And that is all I have for you tonight. Thank you, Alexis. Mm -hmm. Ms. Roussel. Thank you. Um, 
And it's, especially in this really cold weather, it's nice to know that there's a network of caring people out there working to help these unhoused individuals. Um, well, when I attended the National League of Cities, of course, we talked about homeless. And I wondered if um, our community has ever looked at um, something like the pallet shelters, their little uh, small individual housing units for people. I know shelters are just never going to be the thing for some people. No matter what, they, they don't like the, the shelter environment. Have we ever looked at anything like that? We've seen those options, um, like the National League of Cities. They've actually built them out in Colorado, too. They almost look like pods, and they've got storage in the back so that you know belongings aren't just outside and um, they're warm. Um, it's, it's something we've looked at but isn't yet something our shelters have said we need. Um, it is something that if our shelters are starting to say, I'm always at capacity, we're going to have to look for other ways to, to meet that. But the one thing that we have in the city of Dubuque is buildings. And there are a lot of cities that are Im implementing those small pods that, that just don't have buildings that are available and ready. And we do have some that are out there um, and, and ready to, to be used for that. Um, it is better for um, people to be close to a bathroom, close to a kitchen, mm -hmm. and those aren't provided in those. And so um, it's not the best option when we're in a cold climate, but they are an option. And it isn't something that we would turn down if we got to the point we needed it. But at this point, it's not something that we have explored further because it isn't something we've needed yet. Thank you. <clears throat> Ms. Weffel. I just want to make sure I have my head around numbers, which I imagine is it's a really hard thing to count people who are unhoused. Just because of the inconsistency, maybe it's a little more consistent in winter months because people don't maybe move as much. I don't know. but. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds as though in the state of Iowa, our numbers of unhoused have been stable, and yet our number of encampments that we have discovered in Dubuque is going up. Is that right? The number that we have had reported this year is more than we normally have reported. Um, it is the same faces that we've always had contact with, that we, um, we're not seeing a lot of new um, faces when we go to those camps. So it's about a little bit more about them moving around into different spaces and then different people calling. So, um, you know, we get the same phone call and we have PD um, helping every week, um, sometimes three or four times a week about the same two people who are just moving camp. So it's a little bit more about the chronic unhoused that are making all of those calls go up. We have not seen in our point in time counts, which is what we do, um, and we do one in the summer and one in the winter because it could be different. Uh, we haven't seen them go up yet. Uh, the number, and we do number in shelter at the same time as the number out that we find on the street. Um, and so we haven't seen those numbers go up, but again, the calls have gone up, but we are frequently contacting the same people. You mentioned a website that you weren't able to get back to. Is there a way you could tell us what it is so we could? Let's see if I could get, I don't know what browser they had up here. Um, it's, HUD, it's HUD Exchange. Let me see if I can get it back up if they had Google here. Here it is, HUDuser.org. Found it. Thanks, Randy. Yeah, yeah I found it. And this was just released, so I believe Friday this came out. And I'm going to let it load for just a minute. It is a large report. I just and one of the reasons I ask is because you know this is this is something we, we've we've seen um, this come up in the news more often. We're hearing about it more often. You you've said you're hearing about it more often. Um, I want to make sure that as we have this conversation as a community, we're having this conversation with facts. Mm -hmm. um, I think, unfortunately, it seems like. It, it seems at times like we're quick to point fingers and blame somebody. Um, I know a lot of cities are under fire right now for having these challenges, but I've never seen a city probably in the world that has been able to solve this on their own without 
a partner or multiple partners working in the for-profit and non-profit sector. Uh, so, so this is not just a problem that you can easily point your finger at one entity and say, hey, city, it's your fault, or hey, um, homeless shelters, you're not doing enough. There, there's a whole lot of challenge to be dealt with here. So I think, I, I appreciate the fact that you're bringing facts to this discussion to be able to talk about this more. Yep. And so this is, this is actually what I was going to show. This is the overall, um, and this is showing between 2020 and 2022. Um, like I said, these were really important years for us. And they talk about um, this is a percent of increase or decrease of the homeless population. Um, numbers that are in red are, are going up. So you're seeing, like we talked about, between 2021 and 2022, we're having just more people that are sheltered um, because there were more shelter options. So um, that doesn't mean there's less homeless. There's still homeless in a shelter. Uh, being in a shelter doesn't mean you're not homeless. So you know, th that doesn't mean they're any better off than those who are unsheltered if they're choosing to be unsheltered. But it is a good place for people to get resources and first be contacted with partners. Um, and then this report, this was the overall for the, for the nation, um, which had some really good things too. Our veterans um, experiencing homelessness decreased by 11% in the nation. That's a big win. Um, there were some big wins. There were some um, things that are pointed out in reports that we had not seen in the past, and I do want to go up just a minute. Um, our um, black uh, African-American or Africans that are, um, and as indigenous people, are overrepresented in this population, which we do see often um, in people experiencing generational poverty, et cetera. Um, and it's not a good thing. So we are seeing this now reported with hard data showing that. Um, but later in the report, they do get into states and they break down the states. And then on the same HUD exchange, not in this report, but attached to it is a bunch of um, data that is an Excel spreadsheet that goes from 2004 until 2022 by state. And it also tells you race, if they were female, if they were male, if they were sheltered, unsheltered, and it is, just lots and lots and lots of data that you can absorb. Excellent. Thank you very much for pointing us to that resource. Mm -hmm. And thank you also for um, mentioning that these meetings are still happening every single week between uh, the city of Dubuque and other entities in town to be able to, to come up to some solution to these problems as they come up. So um, thank you very much for that effort. All right. Any other comments, questions? All right, thank you very much, Alexis. Thanks for sticking with us tonight. Yes, um, so we have a motion by Roussel, a second by Sprank to receive and file and hear that presentation. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. Resnick? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. Action item number 12 is work session request, Black Heritage Survey. Anybody, anybody? Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Jones. Move that the council schedule a work session for Tuesday, January 3rd, 2023 at 5.30 p.m. for an update in the Black Heritage Survey. Second by Sprank. A motion by Jones and a second by Sprank. That's our next meeting. Wonderful. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Wethel. Jones. Aye. Farber. Aye. Resnick. Aye. The motion passes 7-0. Action item number 13 is work session request, federal and state grant update. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. I move to receive and file and set the work session for Tuesday, January 17th, 2023 at 5.30 p.m. Second. Motion by Resnick, second by Jones. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Jones. Aye. Farber. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. <clears throat> Action item number 14 is work session request travel Dubuque annual presentation. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file and set the work session for Monday, February 20th at 6 p.m. Second. Motion by Roussel, second by Resnick. Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Jones. Just, just for the record, I'll be out of the city that night and trying to try to remote in. Okay. I should be up to date on what's going on with Travel to Buick on their executive board. Sure, absolutely. Yep. Will we uh, at least be able to have a quorum during that one? Is that before a regular meeting? It is. Okay, then we should be good. All right. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? 
Aye. Resnick. Aye. Motion passes 7 0. Action item number 15 is Public Works Snowplow Operator Training Video. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Resnick. I, um, I move to receive and file and view the video. Second by Sprank. Motion by Resnick, second by Sprank. Let's get a preview of what we're in for this winter, shall we? This week. Yeah. Hopefully not. It's the safest way to get people training without actually putting them on a route. So they go through the simulator and they hone the training in the classroom on based on what their scores are um, and any areas of improvement that they need. We have about 30 to 40 doing snow fighting. And so yeah, the smaller the group is, the more open they are with, hey, you know, I've tried this or, oh, I did that route before. You should try this if that's an issue that you're having. And so they're able to bounce those ideas off of each other, which is really great. This is the second year we've done the obstacle course of the rodeo, and we actually got the idea from APWA, the American Public Works Association. They do one both statewide and nationally. We've noticed that if we do some healthy competition in public works, we have really great outcomes. Uh, not only that, but it also breeds camaraderie between the crews and helps them just play better as a team. They have a lot of fun with it. We're learning and we're having fun at the same time. Okay. There was just one for that work session. Right? Okay, great. Or for that uh, video. That's excellent. I, I can't tell you just how thankful I am to have such qualified people um, out there every time that we see a storm like this coming. You know, it, there's a storm being talked about later this week. They're going to be out working 24 hours a day, and I sincerely appreciate it, and I know we all do. Well, that uh, motion was by Resnick, second by Sprank. Um, Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Oh, hi. Kavanaugh? Hi. Sprank? Hi. Wethel? Aye. Jones? Aye. Farber? Aye. That motion passes 6 0. Action item number 16 is Dubuque Ice Arena Improvements Project video. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file and view the video. Second by Sprank. A motion by Roussel and a second by Sprank. We can go ahead and roll the video, please. This is honestly like our second home because we're here three or four nights out of the week, plus usually two days on the weekends. The new blackboards make the ice look awesome. I'm excited to get on the ice and skate. A lot of people came together to make it so that we could open the facility back up again. Anything from the physical infrastructure of working on the building itself, working on all the staffing, getting agreements in place, the building had some settling issues with it. June 1st, we closed it down. We did settlement remediation. We put piles down into the ground. You can't see any of that, but basically all those piles support now all the parts of the building and the ice in the middle. We put down a concrete floor underneath the ice to make it work better. And we were able to then come back in, start putting it all back together. We had promised people that we would close it on June 1st and we would have it done and open on November 1st. The Saints actually started playing a few days early. If we make a promise, we really try and deliver. So we're hoping that they're really excited that we were able to take on that project. And it was a tough project to do in that amount of time, but because of the um, engineering department and the work of a lot of different people, we've been able to bring this to you. And what's gonna happen is there'll be, be so much more enthusiasm around skating and the idea of how do we really enliven this building even more than it already is. I'm at the rink almost every weekend. Plus I work for the Saints. I'm pumped, I'm ready to go. Honestly, like the team kind of builds together, so it's just really nice to have like that community and everything and having the teammates all back together and being able to, it's like a big family here. The Dubuque Ice Arena really is built upon a brand new partnership. We have an agreement with the Schmidt Island Development Corporation and they will be working to be able to not only work with us on this ice arena itself, but also other things on the island and really start to enhance the island to be even more of a destination than it has been in the past. 
There are key elements to Schmidt Island right now. The ice arena has always been one. It really, once it was established, it became a real mainstay for the island. We have the Veterans Memorial, which all of us are so very proud of. And then we also have the campground, we have boat ramps, we have other areas that people enjoy, and the casino is a part of the island. So really, it's a, it's a recreational resource already that's only going to get enhanced as we go into the future. Well done to Marie and the Leisure Services folks and DRA for their help with that and uh, engineering. Um, absolutely, what what a feat! So tough project to have to go forward with, but I'm glad that we did it. I'm glad it's done and we've got our ice back. All right, we have a motion to receive and file. Watch a video from Roussel, second by Sprank. Adrian, would you call the roll, please? Roussel, aye. Kavanaugh, aye. Sprank, aye. Wethel, aye. Jones, aye. Farber. Aye. Resnick. Aye. Motion passes 7-0. We will move on to council member reports. We made it. Powered through that last hour right there. Nice work, everybody. Council member reports tonight. Ms. Roussel. Well, thank you. Um, I know it's late, but I, I wanted to share information about this um, webinar that I attended with the National League of Cities that was uh, sponsored by the Iowa League of Cities on civility. And it talked about... Um, providing an environment where all people can enter in so we can hear all voices to get the best decisions. And I thought I would share their definition of civility. And it said it's about more than just politeness. It's about disagreeing without disrespect and seeking common ground as a starting point for dialogue about differences and reminds us that civility begins with us. And I was just so proud to think about how our city works and how we, we do work together with civility. And one neat little quote they said was to get curious and not furious. So one action I'd like to take is I like the comments that Brad always provides, that our mayor provides before our public hearings. And I'd like to formalize those helpful remarks about civility so that at the beginning of all of our public hearings, whether they be here in our council chambers or with some of our commissions, that we share those helpful comments before those, those public hearings. And I know some of our commission leaders may not be as, um, as experienced in leading meetings and perhaps having those comments ahead of time to remind people to speak to each other civilly uh, ahead of their presentation would be a great start. And so I just like to leave those as food for thought. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And I, I for one, would, would really like to, to take that up and uh, be able to discuss that more as we begin the next year. So thank you for bringing that to the table. It is late, but we always have reports, right? We don't have a closed session for once. I'll once in a blue a, moon, we can actually just yeah. give you a footnote for that. Yeah, um, Jones. A few hours ago, we had a public hearing with, uh, with some dissent, but uh, we had presenters uh, who disagreed with what the council ultimately did, who, who held their heads high, spoke to the issue, were kind, were um, fact-driven, and uh, were civil, were extraordinarily civil. And I, I got to tell you, I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Yeah, Ms. Wethel. I would just love to take a minute to say what a great time of the year it is to enjoy our youth in our community and the arts. And whether it's attending Christmas concerts or holiday concerts or festivities, um, whether it's attending the Nutcracker, which had five sold out shows at the Grand, I have to say that Dubuque not only is a place where the arts can grow, but it's where it's appreciated. And so I think we should all be really proud of that. Thank you. Well, as we close, I just want to briefly um, say thank you for a, for a great year. 
uh, I've been trying to, to think about how to say how much we've accomplished this year, and it's, uh, it's pretty hard to encapsulate into a moment that will be short enough that you would all still pay attention here as we are, are at the very late end of the night. But seriously, though, as we all have a, a opportunity to reflect on what this year has brought to each of us and individually as we get into the new year, I hope you take an opportunity to think about what your service has provided to the community that you've chosen to serve. I think it's uh, really important. And that's not just for the people who are sitting here next to me, but just everybody who works for the city of Dubuque. Um, I think, you know, when you look back on all the things that have happened this year, it is a pretty incredible list of accomplishments. And I, I do think that it's important to point out that we've done so in a civil fashion, in a, um, in a way that we've chosen to work well together and work well together with, with true respect for each other. I think that's really important. So with that, I wish everyone a very happy holidays. Um, enjoy the next couple of weeks. I hope we can all uh, uh, really enjoy some time with family and loved ones and uh, be able to, to enjoy some snow as it comes our way because the, the winter's here and it's a part of who we are. So with that, we have no further business in the year of 2022. So we stand adjourned.